Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Could I call you to order? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second day of our LDC conference. Uh, thank you so much for coming back for the second day. I hope you enjoyed yesterday. Uh, what I would like to do is to offer some very heartfelt thanks uh, to our colleagues at the, the School of Security Studies at King's College London. Uh, they have been admirable colleagues in every way, and it's been a pleasure working with them. And in particular, my thanks to the principal, whose enthusiasm was so important to getting this thing off the ground in the first place. So thank you to all of them. Uh, but also an enormous thank you to my other colleagues, led by our director, Ian Martin. Uh, he was looking a bit frazzled yesterday morning, I thought. <laughs> Uh, but he seems to have settled down after a good dinner last night. And uh, uh, he and Nicole and Olivia and the rest of the team have done, I hope you'll agree, a magnificent job in preparation for an even better conference next year, which I hope you'll all be able to attend. Uh, the, uh, this morning, we have a rich diet for you all, including the Swedish defence minister, I hope you'll agree that his intervention will be extremely timely for reasons all of you understand much better than I do. Uh, but we also have uh, what is termed a breakout session at one o'clock lunchtime today, in which some of the brightest PhD students at the, uh, at the security school at King's will be in conversation, moderated by no less a figure than Professor John Bew, late of this place and currently of Number 10 Downing Street. Ladies and gentlemen, kicking off this rich feast, uh, we have uh, chaired by uh, my old friend and boss, uh, William Haig, a panel on one, what should be, I'm sure, one of our greatest concerns, entitled Air, Space and AI, and I certainly look forward greatly to what they have to say. William, will you kindly introduce your panel? I will. Thank you. My panel. Yeah, no, we are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to uh, join you here at the London Defence Conference, uh, which looked to be a fascinating conference yesterday. And we're now going to have this session on air, space, and AI. You've been looking at every aspect of how defence is changing and developing. But it's impossible to think about that without thinking about technology and what it is doing dramatically in defence, particularly in these areas of air, space, and AI. Uh, many of us would argue we are entering the fastest age of technological change in the whole history of human civilization. And the impact of that on defense and warfare will be absolutely uh, profound. It's impossible to think about the future of warfare without understanding how technology is changing. It's impossible to think of how geopolitics will develop without understanding that. And it's certainly impossible to know how to allocate a defense budget uh, without understanding that. Uh, and we constantly see people be surprised by what is happening. President Putin has been very surprised by how Ukraine has used digital technology in its defense. Uh, the United States and China are clearly engaged in a uh, major contest about the, the future, including on AI, on developing quantum uh, science in the future. So we really need to understand all of these things. And we're very fortunate this morning uh, because we've got a panel who know quite a bit about these things. And it's a great pleasure to be joined by Chris Brose, who is the Chief Strategy Officer of Anderil Industries, 
and he's author of The Indispensable Book, it says here. <laughs> uh, the Indispensable Book, The Kill Chain, Defending America in the Future of High-Tech Warfare. And also by Ulrika Franke, who is a Senior Policy Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. By Tim Marshall, who some of you saw yesterday, broadcaster, best-selling author. His latest book, The Future of Geography, is about space. And Ed Stringer is a former Royal Air Force Air Marshal and former Deputy Chief of the Defence Staff. Um, so I, I'm going to start off the panel by asking all of our panellists to reflect on the war in Ukraine and what lessons they have particularly uh, learnt from it. We've seen software used in a new way, um, such as by Palantir, uh, we've seen satellites used, importantly, by um, Starlink. We've seen naval warfare develop in new ways um, with undersea drones. Um, uh, drones repurposed from civilian use for military purposes. Last week, we saw Russia launch six hypersonic missiles at Kyiv, all of which were shot down by uh, Patriot air defenses. So there are very important technological developments taking place uh, all the time. I just want to ask each of you what you think has been the, what have been the main lessons that you have drawn uh, from that war so far. So let, we'll just go along the panel here to begin with. Chris, why don't you kick sure. off on that? Um, well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I, I, I think as I look at the war in Ukraine, the sort of big uh, thing that jumps out and I'm looking at this from my perspective, uh, you know, most of my career having been in the U.S. government, working for John McCain, Senate Armed Services Committee, kind of overseeing defense. Uh, but then for the past four and a half years at Anderle Industries, actually building a lot of this technology, autonomous systems, uh, sort of software-centric command and control capabilities and the like. Um, what jumps out to me from Ukraine is that the war, you know, the future of warfare is now. Um, you know, it tends to be that we talk about the future of warfare as this thing that's going to happen to us in the 2030s and we have all this time to plan for it. Um, but I think what we're clearly seeing right now is these technologies are available now, they're being used now. These are not like cloaking devices and photon torpedoes uh, that are coming in the future. Uh, these are capabilities that exist that uh, militaries can utilize. And I think the broader point is the way we've sort of traditionally conceived of military power is really around sort of large, exquisite, very expensive sort of hardware-centric things, you know, ships and aircraft and fighting vehicles. And those will continue to have a role to play. Um, but I think the future is going to be built much more around the kinds of capabilities that are, you know, so distinguishing themselves in the fight in Ukraine, which is very software-centric systems, uh, highly autonomous systems, so not just drones, but drones that are capable of real autonomous operations, multi-ship operations. Um, large quantities of fires, large quantities of sensors kind of integrated uh, you know, across the battle space. Um, that's where I think we're really going to generate deterrence and, and real kind of defense against um, <clears throat> aggressors who are seeking to project power, the ability to really kind of grind down what an aggressor like Russia is doing through very sort of non-traditional type means. But when you put them all together, the net effect that you get is a pretty significant capability. And Ulrika, you have written a lot about the use of drones. And uh, is this for you, are there lessons about it? It's a drone story. So I'll make four short points, um, but you'll see that the last two kind of broaden out from drones a bit. So the first thing about drones to note in this war is just how many systems are in use in Ukraine. And it's really baffling. And I mean both systems as in different types and also just the sheer number. So some of you may have seen that, that Rusi just put out um, a report that estimated that every month in Ukraine, 10,000 drones are being lost. So just in terms of how many systems are being lost, 10,000 uh, a month. So that's an unbelievable number. Um, so you have drones on, on, on both sides and many uh, different systems. And of course, the reason why it's even possible that 10,000 drones get lost, and I mean, it doesn't really matter whether it's nine or 11, this is an estimate, of course. Uh, the reason why this is even possible is that we see a lot of smaller civilian systems um, in, in the sky over Ukraine that are being repurposed. Uh, repurposed either, you know, kind of being used as they are for intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, because any civilian drone also kind of carries cameras and, and all of this, or they're being repurposed in the sense that they're being armed, for example, or being changed in, uh, in a way. So we're seeing a lot of small systems, we're seeing a lot of uh, civilian uh, drones in the sky over Ukraine, and I think this is something we'll see also in the future. That's the first point. The second point I wanted to make is I'm really impressed also by how 
Ukrainian companies have begun um, to build their own drones or indeed repurpose uh, uh, drones that already exist. And I would predict, or I am predicting, that once this war is over, hopefully very soon, Ukraine and Ukrainian manufacturers are likely to really rise um, in, on, on the global market as you know, really important um, uh, drone manufacturers. And Ukraine may become a, a drone export, exporter. Because not only do we have lots of different countries working on this, but also all of these systems are now battle proven. And you actually have an innovation cycle in Ukraine where systems are being put in the battlefield and tested and used and kind of sent back with feedback from the, from the troops. So this kind of label of battle proven um, is certainly there and, and certainly very, very valuable. Third point, um, and I alluded to this, but the role that civilian companies have been playing in this war. And now I'm kind of going beyond beyond just drones. So yes, the, the Chinese drones are, are, are really important, but in all the areas we're going to talk about, civilian companies, private companies are playing an enormously important role. And sometimes they provide services that states just can't anymore. Um, I mean, I'm sure someone is going to talk about Starlink and the internet uh, uh, connection here. Um, sometimes they're just providing services that are, you know, cheap and, and easy. And so think about AI-enabled facial recognition provided by Clearview um, and, and things like, like that. So the private sector is very important. And on the, one it, uh, on the one hand, it creates opportunities, and on the other hand, vulnerabilities as well and kind of dependencies. And then the final point I wanted to make, and this is really generally about new technologies in this war, one thing that really struck me in my research that I didn't really think about that much before I set out on, on this project is how much new technologies have enabled and motivated individual people, people like, like you, and, you and I and, and, and other people around the world to be involved in the war effort in Ukraine. What do I mean by this? Well, we see enormous uh, efforts to crowdfund, for example, around the world for the Ukrainian military to buy things like drones. Um, this has become such a, such a big thing that at some point Ukrainian of officials actually said there's a bit of a supply issue here, we're getting too many uh, um, Viracta TV2 and would like to buy other things. Um, but, but nevertheless, so you can see um, an, a lot of people around the world really being involved in this effort. And this is being made possible by technology. I mean, this is done through social media, through crowdfunding platforms. It's possible to pay by PayPal and, and, and using Bitcoin and all of this. And it is motivated by these new technologies because, as I was saying, people are buying, buying drones. Um, you also have kind of cyber warriors around the world or even just, it may not even be hackers, just normal people using um, commercially available tools such as facial recognition software and other kind of anal analysis tools. Um, to help Ukraine, for example, by trying to identify perpetrators of war crimes um, and, and things like that. So I think this kind of involvement of individual people in this war, again, motivated and enabled through new technology is something that I find extremely interesting. Right, now we're stacking up the lessons here. And Ulrika's, put, Tim, Ulrika's point about the role of private companies is very important in the space domain. Isn't it? So uh, can you give us your, your key lessons from Ukraine so far? Oh, there are so many, but I'll stick to just a couple. The, the, the first real drone war, of course, was Armenia, Azerbaijan. But this is the first one where it's really come to public uh, attention. Some of the drones are, are linked to the satellites. 1991 was the, is considered the first space war, uh, with the Gulf War. <clears throat> but this is considered the first uh, space war with serious commercial enterprise right in the middle of it and where two sides have space assets. Ukraine doesn't have its own space assets as Russia does, <clears throat> but it was able to buy in and it brought in all sorts of things uh, from space. And then this leads us to Starlink uh, and the satellites. The Irpin district, the base stations were smashed and the internet went down in large parts of, of uh, the wider Irpin region and, and beyond. Elon Musk's SpaceX flew in thousands of uh, terminals and dishes and got the internet back up and running. Families can now find out if they're OK, organise uh, relief columns, etc. And the Ukraine military, of course, can get its command and control back up again, start using the drones again, start using the satellites for targeting. And they, they use them very, very efficiently to kill uh, the Russian invaders. And that leads me to the second point, which I think is, is, uh, has been around for some years, but Ukraine has brought this into relief, and that is law. Is it now a legal target for Russia to fire a direct ascent missile 
at an American commercial satellite. Leave to one side the fact that, that Starlink is a, uh, a constellation. If you take one of the small ones out, the rest of it still works. It's more the, the concept. And Russia clearly believes it is a legitimate target. NATO has updated its language, uh, attacks from and including and to space, which theoretically could trigger Article 5. Doesn't have to. So these are new elements in warfare, and space is now an integral part of it, the mantra being space is a warfighting domain. And so the last point is the laws are up to 50 years out of date, but certainly are not fit for the 21st <coughs> century. Right, yes, particularly on space. The, the, um, yes. we, we're relying on the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, <laughs> exactly. which did not really foresee uh, these developments. And there's a, there's a related issue, isn't it, of this role of private companies, which is um, what if a private company is not enthusiastic about doing what is in the foreign policy interests of the United States or its allies? Is it then the President of the United States or is it Elon Musk who or is Or contrary to the policy. They, yes. Or what if they wanted yes. to act contrary to that policy? Uh, that is now becoming a much bigger issue in the years ahead. Ed, what are your reflections on the war in Ukraine so far? Well, I'm just going to make one, and we could unpack it over the rest of the, the, the remaining hour, and it's really more of a sort of provocative hypothesis we can test. Um, so I'll pose a question, a thought experiment to this audience. Go back five years, 2018, and pose a general question. You know, who's got the most impressive military, the Brits or the Ukrainians? It's a pretty obvious answer in 2018, isn't it? One is a P5 nation, a nuclear power, it's got high-end platforms, yada, yada, yada. Um, and also in 2018, uh, it's my old empire, uh, it's a full disclaimer, we were writing about everything that's just been discussed by this panel. It's all down there on paper, it's all, it's all on the records. This is the way we need to go for information age warfare. So let's move forward now to five years to 2023. How's it looking now? where the Ukrainians, within just over a year of warfare, have digitised, not just across the battle space, but hooked that into the critical national infrastructure. This is a, this is a national effort. They've now mobilised and got more than 200,000 people in, in uniform and, and many more hundreds of thousands uh, 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 backing them uh, across uh, society. We have you know, talked about the 10,000 drones per month. Uh, we're still at the moment, you know, procuring things like Watchkeeper after 17 years. It will, when it comes finally online, get us 40 drones at a cost of £1.2 billion. And how hollow has our conventional legacy force, that industrial age force, now been shown to be when we look at what we've got in the locker to hand to Ukraine? So I think there's a real a, a question that we've got to ask ourselves in the UK. Why, if we saw all this coming five years ago, have we allowed the three services and the fourth command, strategic command, to move at such a glacial pace and still spend the fifth largest defence budget on the world to produce a force where senior officers are still turning around and saying, we're the reference army in Europe. That's not a T-shirt I'd wear in Kiev anytime soon if I were a British senior officer at the moment. And I think there are some really, really important questions we have to ask before we decide how we're going to spend the next year's defence budget. Well, this is related, actually, to what you have written about, Chris, isn't it? because um, you've written in your book about the, uh, how there are huge developments in uh, defence, new technologies in the, uh, after the Second World War, and then you think from the 1960s onwards there's been a uh, risk aversion or a, yeah. a failure to use research and development in defence adequately. Can you just, it's related to Ed's points, can you expand on that? Yeah, so I, I completely agree with Ed's point. I mean, I would... You can, you can speak to the UK aspects of this. I would say it you know, certainly rings true in the US context where we're spending a lot more money, um, but the conversation is still around uh, lack of readiness for the future. Um, I think those two things should give us a lot of pause. Um, I, I think a lot of it has less to do with the money we're spending on defense research and development. Um, I think it has more to do on our failure to actually grasp the kinds of technological advancements that are happening outside of defense and figure out a pathway uh, and a way to create incentives to bring that kind of capability into the ranks of defense so that we can actually start asking the real questions, which are, how do we need to organize ourselves differently and operate differently to solve these kinds of future problems? Um, so when I, I look at the sort of system that we have in place, and I think that it's you know, 
quite similar in the UK as it is to the US, where we have these incredibly long timelines uh, where we're basically planning uh, for things that we think we're going to need 10 years out. Uh, we're spending an inordinate amount of research and development uh, to have defense industry build those things based on requirements that uh, are very far out into the future. Um, we're not planning on buying a very large number of these things. And then when they show up, we're shocked that uh, they actually don't meet any of the requirements that we have at that time. Um, that system was built for Cold War era systems. Um, and I think that we need to kind of push it to one side and let it you know, uh, deal with those kinds of large ships and capital assets to the extent that we still need those things. Um, what I think we need, uh, both in the UK and in the US, is sort of a, a completely parallel path uh, to bring the kinds of technologies that we're talking about here into the ranks uh, of the military, put it into the hands of operators, and to enable them to do a version of what the Ukrainians have done, which is actually kind of experiment and develop uh, these technologies as well as the ways in which they're going to use them and organize themselves differently with them uh, at a much faster and more iterative pace. And you know, the final thing that I'll say is, you know, I think what, what the war in Ukraine has sort of shown us and uh, what I hope the lessons that the UK and the US are learning, uh, this is about the sort of path uh, and sort of speed of adaptation. You know, if we try to set out what our quote unquote capital R requirements are for military capabilities in the late 2020s or early 2030s, um, I would say we are almost certainly going to get those things wrong. Um, the question that I think we're seeing in Ukraine is when the threat changes, when technology changes, how quickly you can adapt and bring those capabilities in um, and then sort of move on uh, with, uh, with a different sort of set of, set of approaches. Um, I think a lot of that in the future is going to have to be built around software because that's what enables that sort of speed of change and speed of adaptation. Um, so unless we're thinking about putting software at the center of uh, the future British force, the future US force, um, we're not going to be capable of changing at the rate we need to. So this is very interesting because as soon as we get into air, space and AI, really we're talking about software. Really we're talking about the integration of those things. And we're talking about a different mindset in defense that is more flexible, more decentralized than defense ministries and, and militaries are used to. If I've understood what you're all saying. Correct. And, and that path of development doesn't stop, right? That software is updating daily. Um, and you need a Absolutely. system that's capable of modernizing, you know, in place. Yeah. yeah. Ulrika, you want to come in on this, but also I, I then want to take you on to, we've talked about the, uh, the repurposed, dro the thousands of drones. Um, but uh, tell us also about other developments in drone warfare, because we're seeing in other parts of the world, drones developed, not used in Ukraine, that can fly thousands of miles, uh, that raise important issues about the future of defense, about the implications for um, fighting terrorism, for instance. So if you could respond to these points, but also go on to that wider issue of what's happening in drone warfare, I think that would be very interesting. Sure, happy to. Uh, there was one point I wanted to pick up on, and that was um, large numbers. Um, so something where I also think we, in the West in particular, will need a different mindset, as was just said, is regarding large numbers. Be because what we're seeing in this war is that you know, this old saying of quantity has a quality of its own it's, is very much true. Um, we are seeing that, you know, sophisticated technology, new technologies are important and often better. I mean, just think about the discussion about the Leopard 2 tanks, the, you know, Western tanks versus old Soviet tanks, now Western aircraft versus old Soviet aircraft, and one Leopard tank equals, I don't know how many Soviet tanks. Like, that's all true, but nevertheless, quantity has a quality of its own. Um, and Russia in particular is, is, is using that. So Russia is using hundreds, if not thousands, of so-called kamikaze drones, low-terrain munitions, just to overwhelm or really deplete Ukrainian air defenses. Um, and these aren't very sophisticated systems. These are just kind of types of rockets or missiles, really. I always find it difficult to even call them, them, them drones. Um, but they really are having an impact, even if 70, 80, 90 percent are being um, are being intercepted because if you just send so many and if 10% go through, that's still 10% that are just destroying things. So I think what I mean by change of mindset is that we need to realize that quantity really matters. And over the last few decades, especially in the West, we've done kind of two things. We've looked at very sophisticated systems because that's kind of sexy and, and the future. 
um, and we're only buying very few of them. We have very kind of shallow arsenals. Same is true with, with ammunition and, and things like that. So I think um, we may need to go down the, the kind of less sexy role and, and say, okay, we're just gonna buy this one system, but many of it so that we, um, that we have it in store. There was one point I wanted to make, and just on the kind of more general question about drone warfare and the future of drone warfare, I mean, there are lots of developments happening, of course, and some of them we can see in, in Ukraine, as I said. Um, civilian drones, also just small drones, and I want, almost want to say individual drones. So soldiers having their, their own drones or kind of very small units having their own drones, I think this really matters um, in a land war. But of course, we also have, uh, see developments that aren't necessarily um, at play in, in, in Ukraine. What I would uh, emphasize here is AI-enabled um, autonomous drone systems. It's going to be both small and, and large, but just we are seeing and we will see even more autonomy in, in uh, drones. And by the way, also in other systems, just that in drones it happens kind of faster because these, these are already unmanned. As a systems that can do more by themselves, which will mean an increase in speed, uh, which has implications for defense uh, uh, as well. So that's something we definitely need to to keep an eye on uh, swarms. I'm not telling you anything new. I'm, I'm sure you've all heard about this, but um, right now um, in Ukraine and elsewhere, we have mass. So we have mass drones. We have a lot of drones, the kind of kamikaze attacks by the um, by the Russians. But these aren't drone swarms properly to speak of because these these systems, these units aren't communicating with each other. They aren't. It's not one entity or kind of several entities behaving as, as one. But this is something that's already being tested and that we're going to see uh, in the future much more. And um, here as well, big implications for defense systems because these, this is specifically um, developed in order to overwhelm defense systems. Um, and, and yeah, original, uh, sorry, um, uh, traditional defense systems won't be able to, to deal with this uh, quite as much. And then, yeah, you mentioned long range. I mean, we, I, I'm, I think it's very important to look at Ukraine and kind of draw the lessons from that. But there are also kind of the lessons that we need to draw of things that aren't visible in the Ukraine war because it is a specific context. It is a land war where air forces are basically more or less neutralized. Um, it, yeah, it has, as any war, kind of its specificities. And um, uh, in, a, in, a, in another future war that we, unfortunately, may, may be involved with, um, the situation may, may look different and other systems, such as larger military drones, uh, may be more important. Well, th this point is very important about um, AI, uh, increasingly autonomous uh, weapons. And of course, there have been efforts globally, there have been talks about um, agreements on lethal autonomous weapons, which seem to have no prospect whatsoever of reaching uh, any agreement. So this is now a crucial aspect of defense airspace. So the effect of AI is that we're probably in the fastest, most escalatory arms race that's ever happened, because we will have to keep up with each other. And this is, is this also true in, in space, because, Tim, because you pointed out earlier there isn't a legal framework mm. now providing for what's going on in space. There isn't really any prospect of that either is there and so can you with a reference to a couple of things can you comment on that one is what's going on in low earth orbit and the you know the contest for space there but also how many years is it before the us and china are competing on the moon to tap the resources of the moon you know what is our time horizon for having to think about that low earth orbit uh, is increasingly crowded um, Musk's going to put up 10,000 satellites this decade. China's going to put up 10,000. But what's also happening is uh, the more militarization of some of the satellites, the ability to hit them. Uh, four countries have already launched ballistic missiles from Earth and hit their own satellites to test. That's China, Russia, India, and USA. So that capability is now there. The capability is already there to dazzle the satellites, to try and blind them to uh, intercept their communications. And a dual use thing is relatively new. Clearing space debris, you have satellites that have hydraulic arms that can get hold of a defunct satellite and throw it into the atmosphere to burn up. Good. But what happens if one of those is creeping up behind your satellite, which has your nuclear early warning system in it? You get rather nervous. 
There are no laws about how close they should be. Nobody thought about this in 1967. Direct energy weapons are, have arrived. The Americans have pioneered hitting a drone with a direct energy weapon. Maximum range is probably a kilometre, probably less. I think the British are getting these to fight drones soon. Who's going to be the first one to put them on a satellite so that one satellite can fire a directed energy beam at another satellite? Hopefully nobody, because that would spark a new arms race. But we don't have the treaties to ban them. 67 talks about weapons of mass destruction. That's not a laser. So that's what's happening in low Earth orbit. If you talk about the moon and asteroids for mining, yeah, the two lead nations by far are the Americans and the Chinese. The Americans intend to have a man and a woman, they've specified that language, uh, on the moon walking 2026 via the Artemis Accords, which we are uh, a signatory to, 23 countries. And actually, as an aside, what they're trying to do with the Artemis Accords in the absence of a global agreement is make it like an UNCLOS, uh, United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea, rules of the road that are generally accepted. The more people that join Artemis, the more that becomes generally accepted. But Russia and China are excluded and are never going to do that. So both of these entities and blocks, which mirror the blocks on Earth partially, intend to have moon bases early 2030s and begin mining shortly afterwards, exactly for the very minerals and technologies that uh, we require both for renewable energy but also for all the tech of this century. And uh, last point within the Artemis is a really interesting clause. I think it's Article 11, safety zones. Once you get to the moon, you spent all that money, which is fair enough, on developing this kit to get the lithium and everything out of the moon and the hydrogen, you can declare a safety zone. By what law? And what are you going to say to Russia if they land next year? So again, we are in urgent need of updated legal frameworks for space debris, for satellites, for uh, colonization of planets and, and the moon. Right, so these are some of the issues to come. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to um, uh, throw ourselves open to questions. Um, but I just, if you're a defence minister and you're listening, the Swedish defence minister will be here shortly. <laughs> Huge increase in the defence budget in Sweden. Mm -hmm. The German defence minister is trying to spend 100 billion euros <laughs> uh, extra pretty quickly. Uh, Japan is more or less doubling its defence expenditure. So you see huge resources are about to go into defence. Hundreds of billions of dollars extra around the world. Well, how do we know, for a defence minister, what we're going to spend, you know, that you will have your military chiefs saying, you know, we really need those tanks and um, we need more infantry and... Um, we need more uh, frigates and so on. Then all these people come along and say, no, you need software. You need integration. You've got to think about space. Um, we were right five years ago, and nobody took any notice of us. And you need to move heavily into that area. You need these drones, although it might be those drones, or it might be these drones. <laughs> the, what is the balance? For, how does a defense minister strike the balance between the traditional military needs and the new military needs and integrating them. What is the mindset needed here? Ed and Chris could particularly comment on this, and then we'll throw open to questions. Well, across government, we never map incentives. Um, and the service chiefs are incentivized to build a service competitively against, against, against the others. It's an, evolutionary, it's an evolutionary process. I would argue the, the problem in the, the UK structure, there's no actual military headquarters responsible for fighting and winning the next war. If there were, we'd have stockpiles of munitions. If there were, we'd, we'd do the boring war stuff, which is, as Ukrainians are showing, is, 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 is how you actually win wars. But isn't um, it the job of the Ministry of Defence? They're ready to fight the next war. So, yeah, we could, I could go on all day about the difference between the Department of State and the military strategic headquarters. I'd argue you need both, and at the moment we blur the two and we get neither done effectively, and in that confusion, the service chiefs carry on playing the games that they've always played. That's how I'd sum up the, uh, the, the problem we have at the moment. But to move on to your know, thought on acquisition, which is what you're, ta you're talking about, um, and this is across government, and I think it's quite widely known, and you would have some other sponsors here today if these, if these companies hadn't pulled out of the UK in the last year, 
because they can't square away the rhetoric of what we say we're going to do and the reality of where we're actually spending the money. And, and as you said, Chris, it's a problem in the US as well. We don't know how to, to amplify what you said, we don't know how to buy software-driven products because we don't understand in government the min-viable product um, methodology. We can't get behind a company, get something out there, test it and evolve it. We imagine it's something like an aircraft carrier where you write a huge spec and then you compete it. And that competitive element as well, this, I mean, it sounds detailed, but this is an important point. We do actually develop with some companies some quite innovative products. And when we do, and they say, are you going to buy it off us now? We say, no, we have to go and compete it. And then we put their IP, out, tender, put it out in the market and say, does anyone else want to come in and build this? And the other companies go, great, we'll, we'll grab that IP. And your host company is going, hold on. And, and then they back off working with you. So I think the psychology of contracting for government needs to change from slightly adversarial I will go to British Aerospace, they'll build me a carrier, and for 20 years of the programme, we'll, we'll contest over that contract. For the sort of thing you and I have, with whether it's Apple, it doesn't matter who, where I trust that Apple, for their reputation, will drop a software patch every time they find a problem. And I don't know when that's going to drop during the year, but if Apple start to be insecure, I'll move to another manufacturer. And that sort of psychology of working with these companies to keep one step ahead will help us start to build dual use into the way the military goes about fighting yeah. its information age wars. That might be true, actually, across government in relation to science and Absolutely technology yes. in a period of rapid change, including in space and so on, and AI in general, not just in defence. A quick comment, Chris, and then we'll, we'll get some questions. I mean, violently agree with <clears throat> everything that has just been said. I mean, the only point that I would add, um, sitting in the city that invented capitalism. I think the, the problem that we have in defense, both in the UK and the US, is an absence of capitalism. Um, and you're not going to get capitalism in certain kinds of capabilities. You know, you're not going to have uh, capitalism for aircraft carriers. Uh, but boy, you sure can in autonomous systems and counter-autonomous systems and software-enabled systems and mm. the kinds of space systems uh, that Tim is talking about. Um, that's an area where the government, if it, if it is thinking the right way, should be thinking about market creation and sort of using the incentives that it has as the sole buyer and demander of national defense uh, to create more of a marketplace where companies can compete with one another. Uh, and the way that the government can sort of control that and ensure that it, what it is getting is a force that integrates together is by, you know, at the software level, owning things like interfaces so that you can have confidence that you actually have information moving across different systems. And, and the final point that I'll come back to, which Ulrika mentioned, is uh, the future is going to be all about autonomy. And that is a software problem. Um, with all the money that is talking to be, or, uh, planning to be spent, I hope it is not to buy large quantities of people. Because uh, I don't think that you know, we're going to solve this problem by just throwing more British or American people at that problem, particularly with competitors that have you know, four times the population that we do. We have got to think about how uh, actual autonomous systems and counter-autonomous systems are going to work in the absence of large quantities of sort of manual labor, staffing their every move and making sense of their every kind of piece of information. Um, again, that is technology that's available now. You know, that's certainly something that Anderil works on and other companies do too. Uh, there's, there's just got to be a better way of accessing it, getting out into the field and, and learning and iterating and moving faster. Right, very good. Now, if you didn't believe me that we're in the fastest age of transformation in human civilization, maybe you, will, you do now after listening uh, to our panel. And uh, let's see if we've got some uh, questions. There are a couple of mics around, I think. There's one on each side. And yes, we'll go, uh, first of all, yes, to one of the gentlemen over there on um, at that side. Yes, the one at the front. And then after that, there were a couple of hands up. We'll go to the lady who's got her hand up uh, right in the middle, just to make it hard for the microphone. Yes. Uh, Hi, so I'm Robin Brinkworth, I'm a senior intelligence analyst with Everbridge, and we deal with a lot of the AI integration problems that you guys have mentioned already. My question is, there's a lot of new systems, there's a lot of new software coming online. It's all quite fragmented, and I'm interested in your guys' thoughts and inter interoperability between those software systems and those hardware systems, and how that's going to evolve over time, particularly in these different separate domains that we think of as separate currently, but obviously interact quite significantly. Cheers. Right, the interoperability. Ed, would you like to take that? Yeah, very, very briefly, while everyone else thinks about it, it's to just um, shade slightly what was said earlier on about pushing everything down and out. Uh, that does need to happen, but it needs to happen with an understood way in warfare and an understood backbone. 
And a lot of software companies are very good at just pushing APIs out so you can link software to, to software. If we got into the whole business of APIs, we'd be able to link it. But interoperability is a coalition thing. Um, and if we had some idea of what it'd be like, coalition combat cloud looks like, that's suitably alliterative, there's a thing we can... What does the coalition combat cloud look like? And then, let a thousand flowers bloom, how you can tap into that and evolve apps and capabilities really quite quickly. So there needs to be a little bit of centralization. I've, I mentioned Apple earlier on. Apple has an operating system. Everyone knows how you deal with it, but it doesn't try and build a how many thousands of apps now can you download onto your, you know, onto your phone? So I would argue, yes, Alliance Coalition needs that framework, and then within it, the individual services and even subunits should be able to develop their own software, APIs, link it in, move, change tomorrow when things change. Okay, well, let's go. We'll get as many questions in as we can. We don't need to bring in the whole panel on every question. Yes, the woman in the Hi. middle there. Yeah. Uh, so, Nafeli Krabak, I'm a student here at King's. Um, so, kind of in the same vein as that question, but more on sort of the, I guess, political and ethics sort of spectrum. Um, so, there was the first, earlier this year, there was the first um, RAIM conference in the Netherlands. And recently at the G7, um, the Prime Minister said about using an allied approach to AI. I'm kind of curious to see what sort of a multilateral approach to AI would look like and um, how that could feasibly function. In relation to defence or everything? In relation to defence and also sort of an ethical framework regarding autonomous weapons. Right. Now, what's it? Ulrika, do you want to have a go at that one? I, I can, but unfortunately my, my answer is going to be a bit um, pessimistic or frustrating. I mean, right now, and this was mentioned earlier, since 2013, we've had these discussions at the United Nations uh, in Geneva about, you know, autonomous weapons and a potential ban or regulation or anything like that. And these, I mean, these these are really important discussions, and I think it's very important that they're happening. They've also brought the, the topic to the forefront. I don't think they're going to lead to anything whatsoever. Um, and in a way, they've really done the job of showing how difficult this is. And there, there, there are several reasons why, why this is difficult. I think the biggest reason really is that right now, most countries don't feel like they have an interest, an incentive in really regulating anything just quite yet. Because they want to develop and they want to find out and they want to be ahead before they say, tell others, no, no, you really shouldn't be doing that. I think that's the number one problem. The second problem, this can be overcome, but nevertheless, these things are relatively difficult to define. Now, I don't want to overplay this because it's also sometimes an excuse, but it is true that it is much harder to define this when it comes to regulating and banning than it is, you know, with very defined systems, blinding lasers or, or anything. Uh, uh, like that. So, so I think basically what, what we're currently having right now is the situation that there are a lot of international conversations and I think the REAIM conference in the Netherlands was a very good um, uh, first step. It's, it's good that, that countries are talking, but it is very much up in the air. Everyone is still trying to figure out what exactly they want, what they can do, how it's going to look like. No one wants to restrain themselves quite yet. So at this point, I have unfortunately not that much hope uh, in terms of where it this can really uh, go. I think we're all nodding with the same pessimism, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> just a, just yeah. a brief additional point, which I completely agree with, Orca. I, I think the question around norms and ethics are going to be set by the builders of the technology. Um, so I think it's great to be thinking about these questions. It's incredibly important that we be thinking about these questions. I think as Western countries were actively coding these kinds of uh, you know, normative and ethical considerations into our technology, um, but if we collectively are not actually leading in the building, development, and deployment of these technologies, we're just kind of talking past the problem. And that future is going to be set by other developers of that technology, which possibly have uh, very different motivations and very different uh, sort of ethical approaches to the use of those technologies, as we're seeing in China now. And that's why there's no way of pausing this, really. Is no. It? You know, this is the new atomic bomb. This is, you have to be ahead. It's the, it's the new everything because every single time there is a new technology, whether it goes back to the longbow of the English at Agincourt, there is, it sparks the race and no one is going to uh, agree to stop until they see how the land lies and where everybody else mm. is. The good news though is that companies, I mean you said this is going to be decided by whoever developed it, the good news is that at least in the West, and I'm not saying not elsewhere, but I know in the West, the companies themselves are also very much thinking about these things. So, you know, Airbus and others are having, you know, expert groups and thinking about how we do we 
have kind of ethical autonomy in all of this. So it's not just it's not just kind of civil society in the states kind of having their discussion there and the companies just doing whatever or the military is doing whatever. That's not the case. So that's the silver lining. Uh, virtually everybody wants to ask a question now, so uh, we won't get everybody in, but we'll do our best. So yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Joshua Minsky, I'm Director of Policy and Strategy for the Office of Congressman Mike Rogers from Michigan, not Alabama. I need to put that caveat out there. Uh, two, it's two parts, really. The first one is, uh, to Chris's point about acquisition reform, the challenge that we face in the United States in particular is that we create new offices to go faster. SDA is a great example, DIU is another great example. So how do you see that parallel structure developing in the creation of new incentives to go faster? The second question, if I may, is for the broader panel, is we're talking a lot about Western lessons that are drawn from this conflict, but the adversary always has a say in this conflict. So as we look to that next conflict, be it the pacing threat of China and Taiwan, what do you see as China, Russia, or a future adversary like Iran or North Korea drawing from this technological innovation and developing mm -hmm. countermeasures? Right, a very important question. A quick comment on the first part of uh, Yeah, just, just very briefly. I think, you know, pr procurement comes in for a lot of abuse and it deserves, you know, its fair share of it. I think the broader problem we have is it, across the system, both of our systems, U.S. and U.K., you know, procurement is the end of the process, right? I mean, there's requirements, there's programming, budgeting, all these things that have to happen before you even get to buying a thing. Um, what, what I think we do a terrible job of um, collectively uh, is, is actually bounding operational problems and sort of iterating your way through requirements, buying, trying, experimenting, and then scaling things that work quickly. Um, you know, we, I think both in the UK and the US, you know, we have prototypes coming out of every garage and, you know, other place that we uh, have sort of developed. Um, where are the things that are actually getting to scale, right? Where are the things that are actually uh, proving their worth, you know, in operational sort of uh, uh, environments? Um, that are then leading to large contracts to scale something new. That's the piece of this that I see breaking down, where you have new offices experimenting, you have a lot of innovation theater, uh, but there's a failure to transition that into larger programs that make a disruptive difference. At the end of the day, I think that is a senior leader consideration. Back to your point about defense ministers. They're the ones that have to grab these things and say, that is working, I am going to own the risk of you know, taking a significant action to get this disruptive capability to scale. Uh, and then shockingly, as you know, more of these things start to happen in a capitalist society, you know, people will rush in because the incentives are being created to actually do work, demonstrate success, uh, and be rewarded for it through you know, larger scale procurement. And who would like to comment on this? It's a vast question. We could do a whole panel on um, you know, what China and others might learn from the war in Ukraine, is it fundamentally more difficult in an authoritarian If we're moving to an age of the private companies, the sort of the decentralization, um, moving out of silos into this uh, integration, is that more difficult for an authoritarian system? Ulrika and then Ed? That, that's exactly the point where I've picked up on as well. So, so in general, I would say, I mean, everyone is kind of drawing the, the same lessons to some extent because everyone is, is looking at the same war. So there are a lot of uh, things that are similar. But, I, but if, you know, if I were an authoritarian state or, or you know, China, Russia, of course, is also drawing its lessons, I think the big challenge for them really lies around this issue of the crucial role that private companies in the private sector have played in this war. And I think they're going to ask themselves, do we have that? And because, you know, of course, China does have a very big um, commercial sector um, and private to some extent. And you can say, on the one hand, have, these countries have an advantage, as in they have military civilian fusion and they already have the civilian sector very much in their, their processes. And so that's good. We're just going to do this more. But on the other hand, these countries may not necess necessarily have the kind of capitalist uh, competition that we talked about that brought these about. So, so I think that's the, the area that's most interesting um, in a way to, to think about. And for third countries, um, so not potential future adversaries, but more the kind of third countries, the swing states, the global south we talk a lot about, I think they're also very much looking into the questions of can we utilize or work with, well, for example, Western private companies in the future? Like, are we placed well enough to, to kind of tap into that and, and buy, say, you know, Starlink um, uh, terminals and all of that in a future uh, confrontation? Or are we politically placed in a way that doesn't allow um, us to do that? So, yeah, the, the private sector element for me is the most interesting when it comes to the kind of non-Western uh, state. Ed? Just two. 
Uh, the first, if I'm an authoritarian state, it's an old lesson, don't allow democracies time to stagger, form a coalition and get their act together. So yeah. move quickly and overwhelm. And the second for us all, and it won't be lost on them, wars are won in the deep, deep, and ranges are going out. Uh, and we need to start thinking about how we, uh, like the shape, what used to call shaping operations are, are increasingly becoming decisive. So everybody needs to be thinking about how they uh, deliver military operations at extreme range now. Very good. Uh, the gentleman here, and then we'll go back up to the side there. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Sam Olson. I'm from Adaga, which is a British AI company, um, and I'm the head of geopolitics and a long-term China watcher, um, an analyst, and I write to the What China Wants uh, podcast. And uh, uh, just following up from what you just said there, um, we've been watching for many years now China grab hold of uh, Industry 4.0 and military civil fusion, and they're building an incredibly deep uh, organizational structure within the country to bring together the, the, the military and the civil side and creating dual use technologies, etc., all of which are being used um, not just in China but their allies as well around the world. Um, and one of the th things I just just mentioned there about sort of wait, w not wanting to wait for a uh, democratic alliance to be built. Well, the thing is, is that um, we do need to build some kind of alliance, some, some kind of ability to create an opposition to Industry 4.0 um, capture by uh, by China within the West, and NATO of trade or NATO of technology is sometimes the term that's been used. Do we think that the UK um, is in a position to lead that? Um, and if not, which countries can we get to lead that, assuming that we do want to compete with the industrial might that China is building for the warfare of the future? Sounds like a job for the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Chris? Um, so I, I, I kind of come at the question a little differently. Um, you know, I think there's, yeah, the Industry 4.0 piece. Um, I think you know, a lot of the debate is still focused on how we're competing in sort of the old industrialized way. Um, and we're just missing the reality that for, you know, 40 years, if not longer, we have been deindustrializing. So if you look at the state of play as it exists now, you know, 45% of global shipbuilding is in China. Less than 1% of it is in the US, the UK, and sort of you know, related nations. How are we planning on winning a traditional shipbuilding race against this competitor? Um, it's just to say, I think the reality that we have to accept is we are never going to get where we want to get the traditional ways that you know, we, we have been sort of building the force and planning to operate it. Um, we have to make this move to a more digital military, uh, a software-defined military, and a military that's fundamentally built on autonomy. Um, because you know, we're going to have the limited numbers of people that we have, and to generate the sort of scale of force and the ability to strike and sense at range um, that's being talked about here, you're going to have to be able to leverage large quantities of highly autonomous, highly intelligent systems. Um, that is something that you know, the US can help to lead, the UK uh, together, you know, Western countries, Europe and uh, the United States can certainly do together. We have the technology, we have plenty of you know, the people building it, we have plenty of money as we're talking about here. Uh, it's a question of will. It's a question of whether we're actually serious or not and whether we're looking at the reality in front of us uh, you know, accurately. Um, I would argue in the US, I think there's still a significant amount of delusion about uh, how we're going to compete in this, in this sort of future contest um, with, without sort of, you know, kind of a proper accounting for uh, you know, what 40 years of policy have sort of led us to and the sort of the desperate need that we have uh, to make a fundamentally different shift to a different kind of military and different kind of national security capability. Uh, Tim, and then... We'll I think diplomatically there already is... Sorry. Yeah, go on. Diplomatically there already is a, a opposition, whether you've got the Quad, AUKUS, um, Biden's concept of the advanced industrialised democracies, that they are all aware diplomatically that the... The big gap is, is, is the understanding of the technology that is, is required to dovetail with the diplomacy. And we are starting 10 years behind on things like um, getting the rare earth metals and materials and the, the, the supply chains of that. Um, I think they're waking up to this, but um, I do think our political leaders are, um, they, they kind of, they get diplomacy, but I don't think they get the technology. And I think that's even true within uh, echelons of the 
MOD. One of the things the Americans did do, you, you saw Biden's um, uh, uh, Semiconductor Chip Act, where they are going to invest massively in their own plants. And again, I think that's something that the UK doesn't appear to have woken up to yet. Yeah. I think technology is hard for yeah. political leaders. Because, uh, so the expertise uh, lacking in government. And um, one thing Tony Blair and, and I have been advocating together is executive ministers to have the ability to bring in ministers who are actually not members of parliament, but would be expert in their field. And uh, that could help us drive on in some of these things. Uh, but we've only got, we've got six minutes we left. Have a so, question uh, over there. The, the lady up there has, has had her hand exactly up oh, all the time. Very beginning. We're <laughs> going to have two quick ones, because I promise that he was first with his hand up. Then we'll finish off, but we're going to give two minute answers to this. Yes, you, sir. Uh, Josh Bernatche, Canadian Defence Intelligence Liaison Office. I'm curious if we're not perhaps asking some of the wrong questions. So certainly the need to engage in strategic competition over the uh, disruptive technology is hugely important. But if you're moving to a more software-focused, integrated system with massive numbers of new things you're bolting onto that, how do you avoid the risk of compromise through cyber attack, for example, you're taking on huge risk every time you do that. So how do you manage the risk acceptance problem there? And uh, I would add to that just that for all the successes we're seeing about innovative technology, we're also seeing lots of failures as well, right? So like there's masses of stuff that go out that work for a while and then stop working because somebody immediately finds a solution to that. And we're going more into like Russia may lose, but they're going to give us a run for our money, and they're going the way they're doing it is a very old school attrition warfare based on the exact sort of mass right. and industrial production capacity or industrial or stockpile yeah. that uh, you think we need to completely give up on. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure if that's okay. But quick comment on this is uh, Ed. Very quick. Yeah. Um, when you get to the internet of everything, the pathways are going to be so multifarious, if you like, this, that the idea that you'll be able to take down a whole network or what have you, I think, just doesn't, just, just, just doesn't exist. And we get, it's going to be like oil. Every warfare, every, sorry, every war that's happened, the other, one side has tried to stop the other getting oil. You know you can drive across the Sahara Desert, break down, and someone will appear with a jerry can. Uh, it, it, that's where we got to. So I think the information age, data and connectivity... You'll lose a bit every now and again, but it will, it will always be there. And the point you were making was speed. You need to be able to adapt. Uh, and that it's the speed of reaction that is going to keep you alive. It, we're just going to have two wait, seconds. Wait, wait, okay, the, two the, seconds. The failure that you mentioned of the new things is part of that process, right? If you're sending everything into Ukraine and that's working on the first day and forever, like, that's a miracle. It's never going to work, mm -hmm. right? I think the experience that Andrew has had is, you know, you send things in. They don't work. You know, the adversary changes. The electromagnetic spectrum yeah. changes. You know, you have to keep kind of that it's pace changing of adaptation. every day. That's right. Um, right. You get the, the final question. Thank you. I feel like there's a lot of pressure now. But um, my name is Julia Morawska. I'm a senior visiting uh, fellow at the Freeman Air and Space Institute here at King's. And my question is about capitalism and defense. And that is whether or not you have seen an increased appetite in the private sector, specifically VCs, to actually invest in some of these new technologies. Um, based on the, their use in, in Ukraine. We're seeing the appetite in the private. We've talked about the obstacles in government, the lack of expertise and the siloed nature of government. How's the private sector doing? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing VC money move away at the moment uh, because money is more expensive than it used to be and they are sensing the say-do gap between what governments say they want to do, certainly in the UK, and what they're at, where they're actually spending their money. Uh, folding, as we discussed yesterday, ESG, and it's not a good place to invest, and I think that's a problem for us. Ulrika? Um, I've seen two developments there that I find quite interesting. On the one hand, you have the traditional actors, which, and I'm talking here a little bit from the kind of German uh, perspective, which seem still very risk adverse and unwilling to invest even in things like, you know, producing ammunition, not being one, not having the contracts yet and not being sure that they will sell them, even though, you know, you really should think that, that they can sell them no matter what. So big, quite a lot of risk averseness on the kind of traditional um, uh, arms manufacturing side. But then at the same time, kind of the more not quite startup because that sounds too small, but kind of new 
companies um, in the especially military AI realm coming in and being willing to invest quite a bit before having a single contract and VC and other things uh, here matter. So, so I, it's a bit of a glass half full, glass half empty situation from, from my point of view. Tim, yeah, uh, very quick. Venture capital is going into space in a big way, but more on the commercial aspect of it, cleaning up space debris, clear, uh, a potential mining. But when it comes to defense, they are a little reluctant for the reasons that were laid out here. Right, um, we've run out of time, but there are lots of reflections there on airspace and AI that has led us into software, into a different mindset in government, into the importance of the private sector, into legal frameworks that are out of date. So uh, a lot to discuss, but a lot of lessons there. Um, it, it is, you have a, you've earned a coffee break in our audience uh, for 50 minutes. The Swedish defense minister will be here at 10.45, but in the meantime, a very big thank you to a really expert panel, to Chris, Ulrika, Tim, Ed, a big round of applause. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, having gone into the, uh, the technology area of space, AI and air, um, we're going to come back to the uh, reality of on-the-ground politics and, and actions. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to welcome back to King's College uh, the Swedish Defence Minister, Paul Jonsson, uh, an alumni of the Department of War Studies, PhD 2005. I don't get to say that for many defence ministers. Um, and he's going to be in conversation with uh, my colleague Ian Martin. Minister, welcome to King's again. So I'm delighted to be uh, joined by the uh, uh, by Sweden's defence minister today, and welcome, minister. It is welcome back to King's College London, where you where you studied, uh, and, this, and in the spirit of intellectual engagement at King's, there's plenty of scope for audience particip participation and questions. But let's start first with NATO accession. What is the latest state of play? Mm. Well, once again, th thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me. It feels great to be back. Very excited about the London Defence Conference as well. Um, well, the, uh, as you know, we received invitee status in uh, Madrid uh, uh, in July, and then uh, we are now on our uh, path to member, uh, membership. Our objective is to, to become a full-fledged member by, of the Alliance by uh, the Vilnius Summit. We think it would be important, of course, for our security, but we also think it would be good for NATO. Right now, NATO's focus very much, very, very much, of course, on the DDA agenda, defense and, and deterrence agenda, and that means that NATO is going to be now establishing new regional plans. And I think it would be good for those regional plans if NATO, Sweden can be a full-fledged member of the alliance, because then we can become integrated into. Um, into uh, the regional plans and also for NATO's new force model. I think we have assets and capabilities that we can bring to, to, to reach the capability targets as well. So that's where we're standing as of now. And uh, of course, we, uh, with the 28, or actually, if you count Finland, actually 29 out of 31 allies ratified us in record pace. Actually, yeah. within four months, uh, two allies have not done it. Uh, we are Respectable of the fact that it's only Hungary who can make Hungarian decisions and only Turkey who can make uh, Turkish decisions. But we are hopeful uh, that we'll be able to join the alliance. What about that particular problem with Turkey? Mm -hmm. uh, how confident are you that that can be resolved speedily? Mm -hmm. Well, what I can say is that what we focus uh, in this uh, matter is we focus on the trilateral MOU that Sweden, Finland and Turkey has established at the Madrid summit. And therefore, our focus is on implementation, implementation, implementation. And indeed, we have implemented that agreement. We have changed our terrorist legislation. We have a joint NATO's fund against international terrorism. We have a dialogue o on international... So, so these are the list of demands or requests from, from, from Turkey yeah. uh, that they need to, to sign off. Yeah, uh, and uh, we feel that we have implemented it, we continue implementing it, and we take note that the NATO Secretary General think we're ready, we, we think we're ready. Uh, we had the pleasure of having 
Secretary Austin coming to Sweden, first time in 23 years. We had a visit from the, uh, from the Secretary of Defense to Sweden and his message was very clear that it's very important Sweden is ready and uh, it's very important that we can join the alliance by the Vilnius summit. So explain to us why Sweden has spent so long out of NATO and never been a member. It will strike many friends of Sweden as, mm -hmm. as, as curious. Mm -hmm. It always seemed to me that Sweden was a natural fit mm -hmm. for NATO on, mm -hmm. on, you know, on my trips to, to Sweden, but why not? Well, I'm an ardent Atlantist, and I've been, in all honesty, I've been working for Sweden to join NATO for 30 years, and I think it makes eminent sense that we're joining the alliance. Uh, because we've been so addicted to the kind of security that NATO produces and represents. And for me, it's only natural for us also to have a seat at the table uh, and join the alliance. But I think for many people, I think that the um, concept of military non-alignment was very much ingrained into uh, the Swedish identity. There is a saying, I think I mentioned to you yesterday, that we used to say that it's good to be neutral to be Swedish is to be neutral, therefore it's good to be Swedish. I think during the Cold War it was to a certain degree perceived as a position of moral high ground. Now I don't concur with that vision, but the, and I think that, so that the identity of military non-alignment was quite sticky and quite strong. And I think that um, things that, uh, if you look at some of the other military non-aligned inside the EU, uh, I'm thinking about uh, Austria, Ireland, and, and and others, I think that uh, it's been difficult to, to take the full step to join the alliance. And this, the switch, when it took place, was very, very sudden. Yeah. From one consensus to, to another sure. inside Sweden in, in, in just a month, really. Yeah. And here I take off my hat to, to the opposition and the Social Democrats, I'm, uh, uh, because they did what is the most difficult thing to do in politics, and that's changing your mind. But I think they, uh, they adopted to new strategic realities. I say there's two epic dates for, for when these changes happen. The first is on the 17th of December, when Foreign Minister Lavrov in 2021 presented a new legally binding treaty for a new European security architecture, stating that there will be no further NATO enlargements to the East, i.e. Sweden and Finland would no longer be sovereign nations who have the right to choose their own path to security. Now, that did not go down well with us, and especially not with the Finns, that Russia in any way would have some kind of veto over our sovereign decisions. Uh, that, and we'd be some part of, uh, part of Russian's self-perceived uh, sphere of influence. Totally unacceptable. The other thing that, that with that treaty said also was that NATO had to withdraw all its assets and capabilities up to 1997 borders. That, that would be the dagger to the heart of our defense concept, which was very much based on international cooperation. If we could not exercise with NATO, uh, that, that would have been toxic for us as well. The other aspect I think was a defining moment is of course the 24th of February. I think when uh, pe some people say they were shocked when the war broke out. Uh, we had very good intelligence from the United Kingdom, from the United States. Russia had almost 200,000 soldiers uh, along the border of Ukraine. The blood banks was full. I get provoked when people say they were shocked because I think that's, to paraphrase the 9-11 commission, I think that's the failure of imagination. But what would the conclusion we draw is that Russia is willing to take greater military and political risk than was uh, many thought would be rational. Third point I would say is that uh, I think the, what this the war has shown is the difference between partnership and membership. And we looked, of course, at Ukraine. Ukraine being a partner to NATO, being a part of PFP, being EUP enhanced opportunity partners. And NATO supports its partners, but its defense is allies. So if you want to have access to Article 5, the security and defense guarantees, if you want to have access to NATO's common defense planning, you better join the alliance as a, uh, because there's a difference between a partner and an ally. I think those things changed uh, the thinking. I think the Finns were ahead of the curves, but also uh, incrementally also it, ch it changed the mood in Stockholm. And we knew as well that the, if, uh, if we would be the only country standing outside of NATO, it would uh, harper also uh, be a bad impediment for our Swedish-Finnish defense cooperation. It would be bad also for the Nordic defense cooperation. So by Sweden and Finland inside NATO, you're consolidating the whole northern flank of NATO. Well, t tell us 
about that cooperation with, with Finland because, mm -hmm. because, of course, Finland's decision to join was then very important for sure. Sweden in terms of giving Sweden sure. confidence. So it's clearly a very, very close relationship. Yeah. I, I always say that in military terms, the concept of military non-alignment has been a policy in retreat over many years, and there's been incremental steps of abandoning. Uh, I think the first step for us was when we joined the European Union in 1995. Of course, you cannot be neutral against, uh, against uh, if you're in a political alliance. And then, of course, we joined PFP. We've been deepening our bilateral defense cooperation, particularly with the United States and Finland. And with Finland, we had common defense planning beyond peacetime uh, situations. Now, that was not a defense pact at itself with mutual defense guarantees, but it provided us with the option to cooperate in case we were, were uh, one of us was exposed to attack. And of course, Sweden and Finland being the same country for well over 700 years, there's a special relationship. And it's, uh, Finland has been, of course, our closest partner. And if Finland would join NATO and Sweden would be outside, I think that would have uh, had a negative impact on, uh, on our defense cooperation, and also our political cooperation. And assuming that it happens, what, is, what does Sweden bring to NATO? Though I have heard it described as, as, as NATO joining Sweden. <laughs> well, that's uh, music to my ears, who cares? But, uh, well, but uh, w what we can provide for the alliance, as I started alluding to, was strategic depth. I think that our geopolitical location up in the north is uh, quite important, also with the island of Gotland, that being NATO territory, when you can plan, uh, having that inside NATO's defense planning is very, very important for the defendability of Finland, the Baltic states, and the whole northern flank, I think. Now we're going to be filling up NATO's new force model, and we're going to be, uh, or the alliance is going to be upgrading its footprint in in uh, the Baltic states, uh, from battle groups up to brigade size. We we need the numbers and the soldiers to fill those things up, and therefore I think that uh, the the capacities we have when it comes to underwater warfare is for being a smaller country is quite uh, quite impressive. We have operate now, of course. Submarines, uh, we're going up from four to five. We have uh, an experience of uh, operating in what we call extreme littorials. I had the pleasure of, uh, of uh, visiting uh, Aurora, which was our biggest military exercise two weeks ago in 25 years. And I saw the Royal Marines exercising with our amphibious battalion and operating in, in, the, uh, in the Baltic Sea demands some special skills, uh, and we have lots of experience. So. So, the, uh, and also when it comes to air defense, we can provide to the table for NATO's common defense planning almost 100 grippens. We operate Patriot uh, systems. We, we can connect also with other Patriot countries. We have, uh, for being a smaller country, a quite vibrant defense industrial base, being um, the only country in the world of 10 million people who can design and, and do system integration of submarines and fighter aircraft. Mm. So I hope that we also can contribute to, to inside NATO on innovation. And uh, that's something I know the UK is working very hard on now, together with Estonia, in the framework of Diana and NATO Innovation Fund. So um, quite a lot of Russia expertise as well in our defense. And NATO is doing its first war and or deterrence planning, effectively, mm. since, the end, of the, since mm. the end of the Cold War, which I think envisages Europe being divided into sort of north theatre, centre, mm. south. North then obviously leads to uh, leads me to the question of the Northern Alliance, which seems mm. to be emerging, which is uh, Scandi, mm. Nordic, Baltic, UK. Mm. How, yeah. does, how does that fit into NATO? And then, of course, there's the Jeff Absolutely. overlay as well. Yeah, and I came home from war, war came home. Well, it feels like being home, but uh, I came in from okay. uh, from Warsaw to uh, and then popped over in Brussels at uh, at our uh, EU defense minister meeting since we're leading the EU presidency right now. But in Warsaw, we had the Northern Group meeting. Uh, and I, before I was defense minister, I was uh, chairman of the committee on defense. And and before I got into working with the Jeff and the Northern Group, I didn't understand how important it actually is uh, because it doesn't have a parliamentary dimension. And I'm not saying it should have, but I think that uh, 
the effectiveness of the GF, especially uh, under the threshold of Article 5, its strong maritime dimension, its expedition in nature, the openness of the dialogue that we as defense minister have in those forums, especially the exchange of intelligence and cooperation and assessments uh, is vital. So I think by Sweden now joining NATO, we're consolidating NATO on a military level, but also on a political level, because we're going to get closer, because you and I are not going to be partner countries we're going to be allies, and that's something different. So I think that fits very well in with strengthening the, the northern dimension. That does not, of course, mean that we, uh, we not full-heartedly accept or cherish uh, NATO's 360 perspective, because I think that's very important for, for the cohesion of the alliance. But it makes the northern dimension of, uh, of NATO more secure and more stable by Sweden and Finland joining NATO. And if I just could say, one thing in regards to the war in Ukraine and Russia's behavior. If it was one objective that Finland, that Russia had with Sweden and Finland, it was to, to keep us outside of NATO. And I always say that the Finnish and the Swedish NATO membership, that's the mother of all unintended consequences for Russian strategic thinking. But they had it coming, of course. But uh, uh, very f I don't think they expected that to happen. Uh, but uh, it has completely redrawn Northern Europe as far as the New Atlantic institution goes. Now, what's your uh, what's your take on Russia as a long-term uh, competitor or, or, or threat beyond Ukraine? Mm -hmm. uh, we've we've spoken. Mm -hmm before this about um, what you think the Ukrainians are, are doing and the extraordinary yeah. things that uh, Ukraine is doing resisting, resisting Russia. But longer term, sure. Russia as a menace in the, in the neighborhood. What's yeah. your perspective? Well, uh, we, we, of course, uh, Russia's ground forces now are, are tied up in Ukraine. They lost a lot of their best military units in the Western military districts. We, we follow very closely take a lot of hits on when it comes to their airborne capacities and when it comes to their naval infanteries uh, and so forth. But uh, my, my long-term reading of, of Russia is that most likely it's going to reconstitute itself and it's going to adapt its force posture to the fact that Sweden and Finland uh, are going to be full-fledged members of the alliance. Of course, Finland already being in. Uh, they have already stated that they are going to go up from 1.1 million uh, soldiers up to 2026, but to 1.5 million uh, soldiers, uh, establishing army corps closer to our borders. So I think what we need to do is both, of course, step up our own national defense investment and also joining NATO as such. Uh, uh, Russia's military performance in Ukraine has not by any way been uh, impressive. We see weaknesses when it comes to morale, logistics, maintenance, some of the tactical element of it. But at the same time, we also take note of Russia's resilience. They have enormous casualty rates, but then they can do a partial mobilization, as they call it, and generate more masses. And I think it's one thing that uh, that this war has taught us. So there's many, many things that this war has told us, but you know that. Uh, we talked to yesterday about uh, quantity also as a quality in itself, and this war is about scale, 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 to reiterate also what General Cavoli has talked about when the war in Ukraine. Mm. It's also, though, you've, you've referenced this before, it's also about ideas, isn't it? It's also about defending, yeah. about defending freedom. Yeah. Say a little for us about what you think Ukraine is doing. Well, I, I, I always get the question, you know, because it's associated with, with the risk of supporting Ukraine. It cost, uh, we, we sent military equipment for, to Ukraine for the value of 1.5 billion euros. That's about 15% of my defense budget. It's a lot of money. Uh, and uh, of course, it has a negative impact on our long term growth. And, and uh, it's quite demanding and so forth. But I always say that the biggest risk for Swedish and European security would be a Russian win in Ukraine. And that cannot and will not happen. But what's taken us so far uh, is, of course, the will of the Ukrainian forces to fight, the Ukrainian uh, people's resilience and Western military support and unity. And we have to continue going there. So supporting Ukraine is both the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do, because it's also investing into our own security. I see Ukraine as the shield for, for Europe right now, and I don't think that Putin will be 
will not stop until someone stops him. And right now, they, it's the Ukrainians who are doing that, and that's important for our security. So, I mean, I've been to Mykolaiv and Odessa and talked to the Ukrainian soldiers, and I tell them, you're not just fighting for your own freedom, you're actually fighting for our freedom. Because if the Russians would win, uh, that, uh, they, that then the, their worldview would get uh, a lot of hot air, and they would establish, you know, might gives right, and they would uh, abolish the European security order that I worked very hard for, and that uh, the kind of Europe I want my kids to grow up in, and that's where it's a free, uh, where all countries make up their own path to security. Uh, so I think uh, supporting Ukraine is vital, and we will stand by Ukraine as long as it takes. And if, if Putin or a future Russian leader um, uh, was to win in, mm. in, in Ukraine, what's your fear about where the Russian state would look, look next mm. in the European theatre? Well, I, th I think already uh, Moldova and Georgia is fe feeling, feeling the heat and feeling the pressure as well. And, and therefore, I think they're eager also to, to strengthen their relations with, with the Euro-Atlantic community. And, uh, and we take note of the facts that uh, of the propensity of, of Putin and, uh, and his colleagues to take big political and military risks. And therefore, I think it's very important that we, we strengthen the, the defense and deterrence agenda of, of NATO, which is the backbone, of course, of European security and freedom. Yeah. Now, we're going to um, open things up to our illustrious audience. And we have lots of hands up, so lots of questions. First question here, I think from uh, Politico. Thank you, Cristina Gallardo from Politico. I would like to ask whether Sweden is going to join the coalition for Jets or for Ukraine. If not, why? And what sort of contribution could Sweden Sweden make to that effort? Um, and also, if I may, you've said Sweden cannot donate grip and aircraft um, because it has not enough of these jets to spare. Um, are there any plans to buy more modern jets and eventually make some grip and available for Ukraine? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, the, I think the, the jet coalition, as far as I understand it, and we, we, we've been discussing it in the Northern Group and that, uh, so forth, uh, is the one who operating F-16. Uh, and I welcome all the initiatives been taken in that regard. Uh, also, of course, uh, Poland and uh, Slovakia has provided also MiG-29s to, to, uh, to Ukraine. I think it's very important for, for their air defense capabilities. But when I look at the Russian capabilities, and that's my responsibility as a, as a minister of defense, I see that their ground forces are severely both uh, weakened and tied up in Ukraine. But when I look at their naval assets and when I look at their aerial assets, they're almost intact in, in our area. Therefore, it's very difficult for us to give up those six divisions of Gripen fighters that we have because that uh, those are operating 24-7 right now to, to maintain our territorial integrity. And, and Russia is still active in that region. So it uh, would have very severe operational effects if we would give up that. Uh, uh, now, of course, F-16, I think there's also a lot of countries right now who are transitioning from F-16 to F-35, and, and therefore I think they're also looking at how, what can we do with F-16s and so forth. I think it's a good thing, but I have no immediate plan, plans to right now send the uh, Gripens to, um, uh, to uh, Ukraine, because right now it's in the too hard to do box when it comes to our territorial uh, in, uh, integrity and our sovereignty as well. But could could that change at some point? Do you think? Because yeah. there, there is the there are suggestions that yeah. all the focus is on the F 16s mm -hmm. but actually, mm -hmm. what you have could, in practical terms, be more. Mm -hmm useful yeah. to uh, to the Ukrainians. Yeah, no, I, I, I read the Rusi study as well, which <laughs> I, I, I applaud. It was a, a well-crafted... Uh, Rusi has done a wonderful job uh, providing well-informed studies about the war in Ukraine and so forth. And, and listen, the Gripen is a, is a very solid platform. It has a low life cycle cost. It has... Uh, uh, as, uh, the the Operating group and is quite easy as well. It's so it's a, it's a very uh, and it's being adopted for uh, the operational environment in in northern Europe. So it's a uh, it's a highly commendable platform as such. Uh, when it comes to, to Gripen, uh, I don't exclude anything from for the possibilities. But as of now, our operational assessment is that the, the six divisions that we have for 
protecting Sweden, those are in high demand right now. So it's very difficult for us to give those platforms up. And what would it require to, um, to facilitate a change? Is it something that can happen post yeah. NATO membership, do you think, with help and coordination elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I really don't want to speculate in it, but what the message is right now, it's difficult for it. I, I don't exclude anything from the possibilities. I think it's, it's good that the Ukrainians get a stronger air defense, including getting fighter jets. And right now the focus seems to be on the MiG-29s, which are operating. I have respect also for the fact that they want platforms that are better than the Russians, so to speak, and, and therefore they're also opening up for F-16s, and, and then we'll see, we'll see it from there. Question, lots and lots of questions. We had mm. a person who had their hand up first, about seven or so rows back, three or four rows in. Gentlemen here with glasses, just... Yes. Well, I'll start with the, with the caveat, but it's real. It, this is an issue for, for the members of the alliance, uh, and we're not yet a member. Uh, but let me say that as a starting point. What I do think is important with, with, with uh, NATO is Article 10 and the open door policy. That's important for us. It's important for the Ukrainians, and uh, we take note that, uh, of course, the foundation for NATO's relationship with the uh, with Ukraine, they have the NATO-Ukraine Commission, but we also know what we said in the Bucharest in 2008, and I think it's very important that the Ukrainians have a Euro-Atlantic perspective and that they belong inside our family, being it EU and NATO. That's, that's, my, that's my view on it. But as I say, we're not an ally yet, but uh, that would be my instincts, if you ask me. Well, potentially NATO, NATO first as the defensive priority of NATO is the mm. priority rather than the EU? Mm. Yeah, well, I think it's a bit early to tell. I think both are some, uh, some years away. Uh, of course, if we think it's good, then we worked hard also for, for Ukraine having a candidate status uh, as a candidate country also for the, for the EU. So. Lots and lots of um, questions. Uh, question here on this side, and then we'll come to the other side. Thank you. Good morning, Olivier Guita, I'm the Managing Director of Global Strat. Uh, thank you for your talk, Mr. Minister. I wanted to ask you, you seem quite optimistic about Sweden quickly joining NATO, but uh, unfortunately it looks like Erdogan is going to win the election on, on Sunday. He's a very uh, difficult player when it, when it comes to demands. Is there uh, a way around that uh, strategy, uh, plan B, if you will. Uh, US President Biden will likely put pressure on Turkey to, to grant you access, but mm -hmm. is there a plan B if mm -hmm. Turkey keeps on uh, putting his veto? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Listen, to the, the Turkish election should be decided by the Turkish people, so I, uh, and I'm respectful of that, and I think they, so I'm not gonna, be discussing anything in regards to the election. What I can say is that I feel a growing momentum and a growing sense of urgency that we should join the, join the alliance. Uh, and uh, we are hopeful uh, uh, that we, we can do it by Vilnius. But once again, it's the, uh, this is a sovereign decision of uh, Turkey and it's a sovereign decision of the parliament or, or, of the Hungarians. Now, what we have received after we made the decision to apply for membership is that we've been receiving security reassurances from the United States. We've been seeing those from the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. We had a great uh, bilateral uh, signing ceremony in May 2022 on the new declaration between the United Kingdom and Sweden, in entailing also uh, security reassurances. and. Uh, we uh, and many other allies as well. I take note that Secretary General Stoltenberg said it would be unconceivable that NATO would not act in case we would be exposed to a crisis or, or and so forth. But we want to join the alliance also to be. 
to be uh, able to be security providers and strengthen the alliance for is important. Last point I would say is also that we, the, the amount of exercises now we're having in our vicinity is very on a scale that we never seen uh, since the end of the Cold War. We had HMS Albion was there with back bringing the Royal Marines. We have USS Porter, we have naval uh, exercises the whole time. And those exercises, of course, sends both military and political signals that, uh, uh, and as I said, we had Secretary Austin coming to Sweden. Uh, we see that there's strong commitments for the U.S. engagement, both for our NATO membership and for, for our security. So I feel more secure right now uh, than, than before. I think, uh, Boris Johnson, I, I think it was Boris Johnson. Yeah. Um, I think it was that three prime ministers ago. It's difficult to keep up in Britain, but yeah. um, who effectively decreed that Britain views Sweden as de facto mm -hmm. an operational terms a NATO member. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Effectively has that... Uh, mm -hmm. We've got lots and lots of questions. Gentleman in a white shirt. Here. Thank you, Minister, for your insightful talk. Uh, my name is Lukas Erno. I'm with the Embassy of Switzerland here in London. Um, with uh, Finland already uh, uh, being an ally now of NATO and Sweden potentially also moving from the uh, st current status as a partner to an ally, of NATO as well. What will that mean for um, PFP in Europe and especially also for the cooperation of the well previous non-NATO five, mm -hmm. Sw uh, Sweden, Finland, Ireland, Austria and Switzerland? What, how will th this dynamic evolve? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We had the same debate in Sweden actually before the NATO enlargement in 2004 because of course there was uh, the big NATO enlargement when when many of the Eastern and Central Europe, uh, European countries joined the alliance. And before that, then PFP was in a way a stepping stone to the alliance. But after that, many of the more qualified members joined the alliance. And therefore, that made the, the price of staying outside the alliance higher because the level of the exercises were, were lowered. Now, I think now NATO's partnership, uh, of course, NATO can. Uh, can uh, reveal more on how they're thinking about that. What helped us quite a lot was when we got EUP status, Enhanced Opportunity Partnership. That opened up both a political dialogue with the alliance. We could talk with the NATO about the security situation inside the Baltic Sea, which we couldn't before, but it also gave us access to more, more uh, advanced exercises. I think those de our incremental deepening uh, in our relationship with NATO has been very helpful. And, uh, and of course, Switzerland has to, to review what their level of ambition are in their interaction uh, with NATO. But for us, it's been a, a journey. But when the war broke out, we saw the difference when it comes to collective defense and Article 5. That's for the members, not the partners. Next question. Question here in row three, right in the middle. <clears throat> Master's student at King's College London National Security Studies. Um, so Minister, once Sweden joins NATO, how will it balance its Arctic strategy of keeping security tensions low in the Arctic region? Mm. Well, uh, it's something that we are increasingly discussing and debating also in the defense community in Sweden, where by, historically we had a very much a Baltic Sea focus perspective. Uh, that's uh, for many, many reasons. Now, what we have stated in our last defense bill is that we see a strong interlinkage between the high north and the Baltic Sea, because it's one single area of operation. And that means also that we, together with uh, particularly Sweden, Finland and Norway, also have to take a stronger responsibility also for secured security in the, in the high north and northern Europe. And therefore, we uh, we are now strengthening our military presence in Sweden in that region. We're opening up three new military regiments in, in no northern part of Sweden. We are exercising and coordinating ourselves much closer. I signed an MOU with, with, with my uh, 
Norwegian and Finnish colleague in November last year about having coordinated planning. So we're strengthening our military presence up there as well, and we're coordinating ourselves as well uh, up in there. Because we also take note, of course, that Russia is uh, reasserting itself in the high north and uh, re-establishing itself uh, on, uh, on pl places in, in the Arctic that they had previously ab abandoned. That they seem to give quite high priority to it as well. So that's uh, how we're thinking. Where does this fit in with the, uh, with the Indo-Pacific? Because there's a debate, a very lively debate in, in the UK at the moment about whether the UK government has got the balance mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Some people saying that the pivot to the Pacific is a, is a mistake and that the focus should be European security and others saying, well, they're actually indivisible. They're, mm -hmm. they're connected. Mm -hmm. Is there a debate on this running in, in Sweden or is just the priority European security now, mm -hmm. and that's for later. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the defining threat for us uh, and the, the, that shapes the structure and our force structure is, of course, Russia. For, for that, that is uh, ingrained into it. Uh, I mean, we also appreciate very much your footprint in Northern Europe, uh, everything from the responsibility that you have shown by leading a battle group in Estonia, the presence of Royal Navy in the Baltic Sea, the Jeff and your engagement there. And, and, and you are the f first most security provider among the European allies because you have assets and capabilities that are uh, expeditionary and you can get f quick to the region. Now, I, what I say when I meet a lot of American colleagues is, of course, <laughs> what's happening is that we, we have to get Ukraine right, otherwise there's going to be more challenges in the Taiwan Strait. And in that way, I think that, uh, that many countries are falling now, the Western response and how we act in Ukraine and the result that we're showing. And uh, uh, I think also we need to... Uh, invest more time and energy in various ways, also following what's happening in the, in the Pacific. I'm next week going to the Shangri-La Dialogue in uh, IISS in Singapore. And now, because now we have the EU um, presidency as well, the EU has also drafted the new Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Uh, now, what role as a security provider could we have? You know, that's a valid question. And, and uh, well, you have naval assets, France have naval assets, and you have an experience of operating in the region. We don't, but uh, what we have is experiences when it comes to hybrid threats, cy cyber disinformation. You know, we, we work, we have a special agency for, for handling those things, the total defense concept, resilience, things like that. We, we, uh, we can use to interact uh, with, with the countries also in the Pacific. So we don't really have the pressure to, to choose because the, the world is quite interconnected between the Indo-Pacific and, and, and Euro, the Euro-Atlantic community. But do you see scope for doing more if Russia's the threat, mm -hmm. but Russia is increasingly being aided by China in uh, military industry. Of course, we, we, we take note of the unlimited partnership that uh, China and Russia signed on the 4th of February uh, last year, and they, it seems uh, that they're stepping up ambitions. Of course, China and Russia also conducted two naval exercises in the Baltic Sea the last three years, and, and so forth. But that may be more, a little bit more political firework or show force so that rather than a defining threat, but I, I, I think it uh, underlines the importance for us to, to see that linkage at least. I think we have time for a couple more questions. A question from uh, Robert Fox. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Minister Robert Fox, the Evening Standard, veteran correspondent. Um, You've raised total defense, and I've raised it with you in a question when you visited uh, Ben Wallace. Can I come back at that question again? Do you see this as an adaptable concept across close members of the alliance? Mm -hmm. Particularly, could you see a way of adapting the Finnish and Swedish model of total defense for the UK? Uh, could you first of all explain what it is? And, yeah. 
I don't know exactly how well it travels for, from Sweden to the United Kingdom, but, uh, but I tell you what the concept is all about. It's what you've been working with quite extensively is about resilience. I think there is a connection. And since we've been working with a total design concept, it's easier for us to, to work also on resilience because what it's all about is, of course, whole of government and whole of society. I always get the question, what is civil defense? Civil defense is everything in our society except for military defense. Of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but just to, to, to tell you how, how our thinking is for us. And, and we invest a lot of time and energy right now to strengthen our civil defense because we are investing quite a lot into our armed forces, but we also need our society to be functioning well in the case of a crisis or a wartime situation. Uh, I, I, I've been to, uh, quite recently to, uh, to Mykolaiv and uh, Odessa, and it seems that the Ukrainians have learned quite a lot of lessons since the first war in 2014 of working on also strengthening their civil defense and their resilience, because that's what, in the end, what warfare is about. The will to fight and having the resilience to handle uh, a military occupation without your society collapsing. And therefore, it's very important that you have pre-planning in order to assure critical infrastructure on electricity, on banking system, access to the internet, access to heat, warm food, uh, and so forth. And of course, that's uh, what, what Russia tried to attack uh, when they changed their, their, their military operation in, in early October when they starting long-range capability attacking the energy grid, attacking schools, hospitals, civil society. They were trying, to my mind, they were trying to try to break the will of the Ukrainian people. Now they failed on that. But resiliency and a total descent concept, I think, is very important in that regard to, for the whole of society to be able to handle a, a situation, a wartime situation. And is technology a, a, a help or a hindrance or a risk in those terms? Well, that's, uh, that's what kind of dependencies you're, you're creating. But uh, if all your electricity is gone, then, then you have a challenge for our modern society. I think that the Ukrainians have been able to handle it quite well, also with the internet and Starlink and, and, and using satellite-based communications. Uh, and that's something that we were planning for as well. But uh, access to electricity is really vital for our digitalized society. I'm, I'm very impressed also with, I talked about the war in Ukraine being very much about scale. Of course it is, but it's also about innovation and the ability of the Ukrainian people to innovate and adapt, I think, has been crucial. And it's provided them with an edge uh, above the R Russians that's been indispensable. Everything from the apps and, uh, and how, how they go about doing things. Yeah, technological innovation, yeah. clearly vital. Um, question here. I think we've got time for one and perhaps one or two more questions. Yeah. My name is Peterson Silva from the Brazilian Defense College. Uh, in the current geopolitical landscape, I would like to know, if possible, how do you see the future of the Brazil-Sweden partnership uh, regarding grip and fighter? It will be grow, it will be maintain. How do you see this partnership in the coming years? Thank you. Well, I had the honor of having a bilateral VCT with you. Uh, video conference with uh, your defense minister just a few weeks ago and my state secretary went to Lod and we have a very good cooperation on the Gripen system and I think it's also a quite strong industry to industry cooperation as well. Uh, uh, so I, we look very favorable on our cooperation. We learn a lot from you. There's a dialogue of Embraer and, uh, and, and Saab and uh, we're very we're pleased with how, how that uh, cooperation is working, uh, and uh, we want to develop it even further. I hope to. I invited uh, my colleague to come to Sweden, and uh, I'm hopefully going to Brazil soon. So it's a, it's more than an arms deal. It's really a partnership between two countries, which we uh, very much appreciate on the Swedish side. Time for one last question, I think. We're we're, we're on. We're, we're pretty much out of time. Um, Minister, thank you very much for that uh, absolutely fascinating range of insights. Thank you for taking the time to come to London to talk to us at the London Defence Conference uh, and our audience will show their thanks. So thank you. Thank you.
And I'm delighted to say we've got a, a fantastic panel, and indeed an all-female panel, which uh, at a defence conference is uh, quite remarkable, really, I suppose. Uh, and uh, joining me are uh, from furthest uh, from me is Dr. Malfred uh, Braut Heghammer. She's professor of political science at the University of Oslo, particularly an expert in uh, nuclear. Uh, next to her is Polly Scully, uh, long-time employee at the Ministry of Defence, who's now working for. Palantir, the uh, data organisation. I don't know what verb goes with it. Data scraping. Data integration. Data what? Data integration. We data, own data. Data <laughs> integration, right. OK. Uh, then next to her, we have uh, Dr Francesca Garetti, uh, analyst at uh, Mercator, the Mercator Institute for China Studies uh, in uh, Brussels. She's um, a long-time uh, associate, in fact, was the Leverhulme Fellow here at King's College London, where she got her doctorate. And then finally, closest to me, uh, we have Professor Helen Thompson, Professor of Political Economy at Cambridge University. Now, um, anybody who's ever sat in a board or whatever has spent a lot of time uh, agonising over the risk register. What are the risks to your particular organisation? So I'm just going to start by asking uh, each of my panellists in terms of future risks what they would put on the list. And, you know, very often these games are played with traffic lights. Is it a red risk, a green risk? Uh, or uh, a orange one. I'll start with you, Professor. <laughs> well, obviously, I think you could pretty much put almost all the world on the risk list at the, at the moment. Um, but I would pick out um, three. The one very obvious that I'm just going to say, because it must be said, um, Taiwan. But uh, the two I would think that are not getting as much attention as they, as they should is the Arctic. Uh, and the way in which Russia has actually economically strengthened, I think, its position in the Arctic over the last year, uh, particularly its use of the Great Northern Sea Route. And that is despite the fact that politically Russia is much more isolated as an Arctic power than it's ever been before, if and when. Um, Sweden joins NATO, then all the Arctic powers except for Russia will be in NATO. And the second I would put on the list is the Persian Gulf. I think we kind of forget now that at the beginning of 2020, so before we all became consumed with pandemic fears, that the narrative was that World War III was about to begin thanks to Donald Trump in the, in the Persian um, Gulf. Obviously, that didn't turn out to be the case, but I don't think that the Persian Gulf risks have gone away. And that what we've seen in the, in the last um, few weeks uh, is back to some of those dynamics that preceded the, the January 2020 um, crisis in the preceding months building up to that, and that is Iran's seizure of some civilian ships in the, in the Gulf, increased military patrols by the United States, Britain and Russia, joint military um, exercises from Russia, China and Iran. So if the world's been dividing into those blocks as a result of the war, we're beginning to see that tension manifest itself quite acutely, I think, in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf in particular. OK. Um, Dr Gretti, what, from your perspective, what would you put on our risk register, our future risk register? So from my perspective, which is a, a little bit of a China bias perspective, so you will apologise to me for that, um, so China's economic performance is a short to medium term risk, uh, both internally as Chinese economy is not performing as well as we would have hoped. Um, of course, you know, there have been articles saying, oh, actually China is overperforming, but that is because the expectations were extremely low. Actually, Chinese economy is not picking up, consumption is not picking up as we were hoping for. Small and medium enterprises are also not performing as we would love, and that is, is sort of the signs of a healthy economy. And the problem with that is that China is a major economic player in the global economy, and so if his economy doesn't pick up, then we have a global issue. And on top of this, you have the, external, the sort of the external element to it, which is all the debt that China has been accumulating in a series of developing countries through or you know, outside the Belt and Road Initiative, now is quote and unquote going bad. And so you have all these debt being, uh, sorry, defaulting, and all these countries potentially have to default, a couple of them have already, to be honest. 
And this would also put a strain in global growth and global economy and so on and so forth. And maybe we can talk about the deeper implications of all of these, how much we're talking about and you know, what, what it means for the global economy. And a poorly economically performing China means a more unstable China, which means a lot more nationalism. It means the acceleration of some of the geopolitical risks that have been mentioned, for example, by the professors, such as you know, um, escalation in the Taiwan Strait and, and so on and so forth. Um, and we've seen this happening already. The second problem that I see, sorry, the second risk that I see emerging is fragmentation of, the, of globalization of the global supply chains and so on and so forth. And I'm afraid that this fragmentation is happening much faster than we would hope so and is happening before any of us is ready. We're seeing yesterday was said that you know, Western international companies are diversifying. I'm not as confident, at least you know, uh, it, as, as far as continental European companies are concerned. What we're seeing is a lot of doubling down and deepening of the exposure of these companies within the Chinese market. And that means that you know, if you have disruptions of these linkages, then um, this, uh, this, you, know, you have implication and a major risk for a global economy. Thank you. Polly Scully. Uh, great, thank you. I'm, I'm going to move away from the geopolitical, although I think some of the things I'm going to talk about can sort of be made worse or uh, manifested by geopolitical situations. Uh, the things that worry me, which is a bit a sort of unfashionable, but another pandemic, um, and extreme weather uh, and the manifestation of climate change um, in that sort of way. But in particular, the thing I worry about are the things that we haven't experienced before, so we don't understand how they will manifest. And, and particularly, I would point to the cutting of undersea, or the loss of undersea cables, not necessarily cutting, um, and the loss of electricity and power and how that would affect our society. I suspect lots of people sort of think, oh, I, can't, I couldn't get on the internet, and that would be very bad. But actually, all of the other impacts that would be manifested from that and the ability to sort of, as a system, trace through those and understand those. Um, I also worry about, and this is sort of maybe slightly outside of the category, but um, chronic risks like the cost of living and how that manifests upon a society and weakens, generally weakens a, a society. Um, and the final thing I would say is that the thing that I saw towards the end of my career in um, the civil service was an increasing, and lots of people have talked about this, but an increasing interdependence of risks and the fact that one risk will compound another risk. Um, and that is very hard to predict in advance. Um, so that's the thing that worries me as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'll go back to the geopolitical piece um, and focus on the uh, intermediate term nuclear risks. Um, over the past year or so, understandably, a lot of focus has been on Russian nuclear threats. Um, and I think that the, the experts are still arguing about uh, what, what to make of those. Um, I also note that there seems to be some slight transatlantic uh, divergences of opinion uh, in that regard. But, but my concern really uh, focuses on the longer term, uh, the increasing Russian reliance on nuclear weapons, especially in the high north. Um, and that paired with uh, NATO expansion, paired with increasing Chinese interest, uh, means that the High North will be far uh, busier and of interest to a greater number of actors than it has uh, been during the Cold War. And this happens uh, at a time when the risk reduction tools that we have are frankly not that appealing to a lot of governments. Um, I think that is also something that uh, requires more attention. Uh, what can we learn from past formats that worked during the height of the Cold War that could be adapted um, for the future? Because I do think that the risks of uh, unintended escalation um, are uh, quite significant moving forward, perhaps also uh, intended. The second uh, risk that, that I'm concerned about relates to the subsea infrastructure. Seen from the perspective of a small, peaceful country where in the past couple of years or so we have seen that we are quite vulnerable in our uh, openness in allowing subsea mapping on web, uh, software websites that are accessible to other countries in terms of how we treat our infrastructure. Uh, to uh, companies from China and Russia, for example. So I do think that some, some important risk reduction uh, efforts need to, need to focus on how open can we be uh, as liberal societies in the face of, of a rather changing neighbourhood. 
Thank you very much. We will be taking questions in the second half of uh, our 50 minutes or so, uh, so do have those ready. But let, let's start with the geopolitics. I'm, I'm interested, Francesca, you started out really with the economic risk of China as a global engine going down. What about the security risks? I mean, there are uh, there are there is a number of, of security risks, and of course, uh, we talked about the security risks emerging from the economic lack of you know good performance on, on 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 the front in terms of security risk taiwan has been mentioned uh, the pla is becoming a proper and advanced army that can definitely um that in time will be able to definitely bring forward some of the uh, operations that it plans to um the other point that I think is particularly important is that China, often many, many actors rely a lot on China being able to um, solve some of the security issues that we have nowadays, such as the conflict in Ukraine. You know, the, the peace plan, so-called peace plan that China has put out in terms of how to solve the, the, the conflict in Ukraine, which wasn't a peace plan, it was a position paper, really. So I think that from a security point of view, you have that aspect, which is can China be a global player and a reliable global player or not? And at the same time, that answer underpins whether, for example, how we treat um, technology corporations, how do we treat the presence of Chinese investments and Chinese technological infrastructure in our countries, and how do we behave in, in these global conflict situations? And then when, when you talk about risks, risk of what happening? Well, I think that we're talking um, in the case of Taiwan about the risk of war. I think we're talking in the case um, of the Arctic of Russia being able actually to at least potentially strengthen its position as an energy power um, through the development of resources in the Arctic and the fact that essentially European companies have not all entirely pulled out, but the, the ones that are now providing the critical technology that Russia needs for that is China. And that if we move into a world in which the, the geography or the, the, the transit geography um, of energy trade, particularly oil and gas, um, is transformed, and that that route to, from Russia to Asia becomes more important, and the route that involves the Suez Canal becomes less important. And at the same time, we see the tussle for influence within the, the Middle East. Then we start living in a, a really quite different geopolitical world. And that in itself, I think, is a risk because it, in order to, for us in the West to, in some sense, function in that world, we need to understand it very well. And I don't think that we, and we don't think that we do. I, I think in the, in, the, in, in the Persian Gulf, the risk is not war, but there, it's a risk, a set of risks uh, around the sharp deterioration of relations between the major powers as a result of these tensions <laughs> over the, the um, Persian um, Gulf, with the possibility that you get something that goes wrong, uh, a seizure of a, of a vessel, say, that is not expected and that we get a reaction from the Americans to something that the Iranians do, and then we move into something that's got the possibility of not, as I say, full-scale war in the Middle East, but certainly some level of, of violent confrontation there. And that was what was going on in 2019 and the build-up to um, January um, 2020, um, when um, Trump ordered the assassination of the, the leader of the um, Iranian uh, Revolutionary um, Guard. So... I think that we need to understand that the Middle East as a problem has not gone away and that China is very much a player in the Middle East and perhaps more so than it was when those events were going on in 2019-20 because it's simultaneously, or sorry, I should say since then, strengthened its relationship with Iran, got a stronger position on the Strait of, of Hormuz. So that is a place where we have US and China with the potential to come into collision with each other again in the same way in which they obviously can, and we understand that over Taiwan. Holly. Um, so just building on that at that point, I think it, um, to me it comes back to, and we used to quip when I was um, working in the Ministry of Defence, but would say the global world order is crumbling. 
Who do we email on Monday to sort that out? So how do you start working through what it is that you can do to mitigate those risks? Um, and in particular, thinking about, um, I found the Xi and Putin statement on, on just before the Ukraine invasion really interesting because it set out a, a vision. Um, and that vision is quite compelling if you read it once. If you read it a few more times, it feels a bit less compelling. Um, but I, I, I would love for us to be thinking about as um, uh, Western democratic states about what, what is our vision, what is our equivalent to that, and how do we start building a world order that is shaped against values that the majority of people can get behind. And, um, Roger, you were talking about the perspective from a small country. Where do you see other countries that haven't been global leaders? I mean, we know that the BRICS, for example, are going to have their meeting. We know that there appears to be a rapprochement between, uh, to a certain extent, between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. Where, where do you see them fitting in? Are they not, as it were, on our side in the West? I am keeping a close eye on Iran. Uh, I think that is certainly an area where if Ukraine hadn't happened, uh, I think a lot more attention would, would go into that and the process with uh, the Syrian uh, government as well. So the ground in the Middle East seems to be uh, shifting somewhat. Um, I'm not, uh, I still think that for Saudi Arabia, the US is, is the main friend and ally and that uh, that is unlikely to change in the near term. But I, I also think that developments in Iran's uh, nuclear program um, will be uh, a key factor there also. I mean, you, you've written about why Iraq and, uh, didn't get nuclear weapons in the end. Where, where do you think Iran is on that, but effectively has them or not? Uh, very, very close. Um, Iranian officials I've, I've talked to also say that we're effectively punished as if we have nuclear weapons without having them, leaving the rest to your imagination uh, to figure out where, where they would likely go from there. So uh, with the steps that they have taken uh, to scale down from the JCPOA, they are very close indeed, and I think that the Israelis are very much concerned with this as well. And what, and what does Iran want? <laughs> Who knows what the answer to that question is, but what I think that I would say is that I think that the Saudis are moving away um, from the United States. I think they've had to swallow a lot on the Iran rapprochement question because of the Iran's um, nuclear weapons um, development. But if you think of it as a situation in which Saudi Arabia has had now about 10 years to get used to the fact that the United States became again the world's largest oil producer, is that you know, it has been through a number of reactions to that. It tried to bankrupt the US shale industry unsuccessfully, 2014 to 16. It then, because it failed, had to basically make up with Russia. That was the creation of OPEC Plus in late 2016. Uh, Bin Salman and Putin then fell out quite badly in early 2020 when the pandemic started about how to deal that. But ironically, Donald Trump kind of put them back together again. And since Russia's war began, then Saudi Arabia has aligned itself quite strongly with Russia. There's no break in OPEC plus as a result of um, the war. Biden administration has several times pretty much begged the Saudis to increase the production of oil or to increase the production quotas with OPEC plus. It hasn't, um, it hasn't really um, happened in any meaningful way. And indeed, in the run up to the midterm elections, OPEC plus uh, imposed production cuts in a way that was humiliating. Um, to um, Biden. They've moved to being in a more sort of tolerant position to Assad, um, even just in the last um, few months. The, I think what wasn't just the Chinese initiative, but it was actually a Russian initiative too, to bring about this reproachment of re-establishing diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran has um, taken um, place. I don't see anything we could really point to as evidence in the last year and say, the Saudis think that the way to deal with their predicament now is to keep as close to Washington as possible. Maybe that would change under a different president, but I'm not even entirely um, convinced um, about that. So I think that, you know, effectively, the Saudis are asking 
the Russians and the Chinese to help them keep Iran on side. Now, what that means in terms of Iran's position, I think, is, is, uh, is open to um, question. But the one thing I would say is we can see that gas isn't going away as an energy source. Um, we're not going to have a rapid transition away from um, gas. And between them, Russia and Iran control about 40% of the known gas reserves in the, in the world. And Iran really is going to matter for that reason alone, even leaving aside what, what it might or might, not, might or might not be up to with the Chinese in the Persian Gulf. Just before we take questions, um, Palantir is involved, as you say, in, in, in dealing with data. Is communications, information, distortion of information, is, is that going to be the next war effective? Oh, gosh. Well, I think it's a, so I think there's kind of two, two angles on that. One, I think, is that the power that you can unlock by um, friendly nations being able to share data and understand, all organizations understand that which is knowable immediately is huge and is a huge advantage that we should take advantage of because what I saw, and I worked on the Salisbury response, but I, I remember so vividly feeling how powerful it was that NATO nations were all standing up and expelling diplomats at the same time and the strength of that alliance um, was just phenomenal. And the sharing of data and information is a huge strength that, that can be brought together. Disinformation um, is, a, is a big issue and incredibly uh, hard to deal with. I'm definitely not an expert on, on how one does it. Does that. it involve effectively the risk of handing over national power to transnational bodies to, to tech giants effectively? Um, no, no, because there's sort of governance around that and the data can always, is always owned by the, the um, nations that provide that data. But I, I think there is a really interesting conversation to have around the power of um, tech firms and the sort of, not equivalents of a nation state, but the power, and, and it's been shown in Ukraine, you know, Elon Musk giving um, Starlink, um, and having a conversation about what, does, what are the rights and obligations that we would put on these big, powerful firms. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I do think a conversation around that would be a good conversation to have. I mean, Malfred and Francesca both talking about worries about societal breakdown, effectively, as we get poorer, um, relatively. Where does data fit into that? Can data help with that? Absolutely, yes. I mean, so I... I think the ability for um, people to understand and know the truth of a situation is phenomenally powerful. And you talk, we talk about the democratization of data. So information ceases to be power to a small group of people. It is power for the society as a whole. Um, and just, just on the point of um, societies breaking down, I think there is a huge amount of work that I would love um, for people to do around how you build a resilient society. And I love the Scandinavian total defense model. So how do you how do you build that cohesion between people? We saw it at the beginning of COVID. It was amazing. It then sort of went away. But how can we, if we're talking about there's you know, a phenomenal amount of risks that might hit us in lots of different ways, there are things that you can do that are powerful against all of those risks. And building a um, resilient society is something that that will help us in any situation. Do you agree, Manfred? Very much agree. Um, and I, I do think that uh, there is, uh, let, let's say, ver varied levels of knowledge within European NATO member states about when it comes to understanding uh, threats, when it comes to understanding deterrence, the investments that are required to, to meet those both threats and risks and challenges. And I do think that this is an overdue conversation. I think within the Alliance, for a long time, there has been a focus on a generation gap within the levels of governments, certainly in smaller states. But I do think that we shouldn't forget about the population uh, either. And so I, I very much think that those conversations and those efforts are central, in, certainly in Norway, but, but likely in other countries too. I mean, I absolutely agree on the need for a resilient society. I, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Um, but I think that sometimes what we're doing currently is really focusing on bilateral relations, is, especially when it comes to the economic relationship. Mm -hmm. And the risk that we are now running into is to develop, for example, um, in indirect dependencies or indirect risks. So if we take, for example, active pharmaceutical ingredients, which during the pandemic were a huge issue, um, Europe is mainly dependent on China and India. 
But then the risk is we, we may want to diversify out of China into India. Great idea, right? Except then India imports most of its active pharmaceutical ingredients from China. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying all of these because this is a great idea and is much needed. But I think we need to remind ourselves that these are multilateral solutions and need to remain multilateral solutions. We can't become protectionists. We can't become bilateralists. It really needs to be an effort that brings together more actors and more countries. Helen, you started by saying the world's at risk, um, which presumably was a reference to climate change uh, to a certain extent. You've been talking a lot about the balance of power to do with energy flows. Are we getting anywhere in terms of uh, alleviating the, the, the climate change risk? I think that we're struggling, the best that could be said in a way. I mean, I think that what we have to we have to understand is is that the energy transition needs to be rapid but is likely to be really quite slow and that some of that is because you know not perhaps the best decisions have been made but quite a lot of it is simply because it's incredibly difficult to undergo an energy transition of the kind that we're trying to it's not an energy transition, if it succeeds, it would be an energy revolution. It would be in reinventing the entire energy basis of the world's material civilization. And a set of risks come in trying to do that in the same way in which there are these profound risks that come from what we're trying to address, um, climate change. And I think that we can understand why we want our energy systems to be more resilient but at the same time, is like particularly in European countries, we are not going to have risk-free energy. It's not, it's not possible. Um, because even if we succeed in decarbonising the electricity sector more rapidly than we're doing at the moment, even if we succeed in electrifying um, transport, the amount of foreign metal dependency that European countries are going to acquire from this is going to be huge. And there's going to be a set of geopolitical risks attached to that. We can already see in Latin America, where you know, countries which have some of the metals, like lithium, that are you know, crucial for the energy transition, we're all already beginning to see metal nationalism. You know, it's something that looks a bit like what oil nationalism out of the Middle East looked in the, in the um, 1970s. So we're going to have to get used to a whole new set of, of geopolitical risks that come from the energy transition. At the same time, as the geopolitical risks that come from the existing fossil fuel energy regime are going to remain in place because the energy transition is, by necessity, going to be quite slow. OK, have we got any questions in the audience? Yeah, we have a uh, lot, lot over there. Um, you've got the microphone. There you are. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, just say, gentleman, Neil there. I think the mic is off. Sorry, not to be like <laughs> such a no, I think you're right. party ruiner. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, very, very important question. Um, I think perhaps first of all, um, the, 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 part, the current and older structure of treaties and regimes uh, is largely finished. I think we have to think in new frameworks. I think that these large uh, treaties are, uh, for better or for worse, uh, both could be said, uh, a thing of the past. And I think that Moving forward, um, I would very much agree with Rose Gottemuller and others who point to more uh, sort of political measures, unilateral steps in order to build toward something that would integrate China into these arrangements. 
uh, recent statements uh, that I've seen from, from various Chinese officials have not been very encouraging. They haven't been for a while, but I do think that increasingly there's a realization that this is where we are ultimately moving towards and developments in, uh, in various uh, Chinese modernization programs and capabilities sort of suggest that um, the, the size and capabilities that they have uh, are perhaps increasingly uh, prepared for that kind of future. That said, they seem to be at the early stages of a modernization process. And when countries are at that point, they rarely want to enter into binding restrictions. So we may need a little bit of uh, time uh, in which we explore these uh, other kinds of measures um, in, the, in the interim period. So I do think that, that we are traveling uh, in somewhat uncharted waters where uh, we do need to think creatively and also look to the past because there are some examples of, if you want to call them confidence building measures, risk reduction measures, tools that we can apply um, in this changing context. But I think we should prepare for, for significant changes. So we should have added to our risk the potential collapse of the sort of post-Second World War world order based around the United Nations. That's a, does China want to collapse it? So China is taking great advantage from that world order, and we should always remember that. So it, it, doesn't want to it doesn't want the order to collapse. It wants to hijack the order and then pick and choose the parts that it wants to keep and change those that it doesn't want to keep. It wants to... A bit like the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they always do this comparison. They always say, you know, the US has done it. Why shouldn't we now that we're powerful? Can I make sorry? Can I make a bureaucratic yeah. point? Um, so what Morford highlighted is um, there is a whole amount of thinking that needs to take place, um, and I have a concern that the that the people doing the thinking and the people making the decisions are sometimes a bit dislocated from one another. Um, and one of the, my favourite things about the integrated review refresh was it talked about having a strategic affairs card, for want of a, a better word. But the people in government who can talk to people who are doing the big thinking about what are the decisions we would make as a consequence of these big thoughts um, and making sure that that link isn't broken because unless you do something about these problems, unless you create new frameworks, have new conversations, you're just watching a problem. That is a perfect moment for a commercial. Don't forget, at lunchtime today, John Bew, upstairs on the eighth floor, uh, is chairing a panel on uh, those very subjects, who, of course, did the review for number 10. Yeah, next question, please. So hopefully this works. Okay, great. So Robin Brinkworth from, I'm a senior intelligence analyst at Everbridge. And one of the things that has kind of been touched on is this idea of cascading risk from, you know, multiple risks uh, becoming interdependent. And one of the things I'm curious about is we've talked about resilient societies and to use an example, right, the British water resilience has been in the news because we have polluted rivers and things like that, because that is a a, a kind of policy decision that was taken several decades ago, and we're now seeing the impacts of of the frailties of that original policy decision. And I, what I'm really getting to here is how do we, as democratic societies, get beyond the first, second electoral cycles coming up and look at how do we build resilient societies for 34 year, 30, 40 year hor time horizons and build in resilience with a kind of national directive uh, in that manner. Oh, that's what you're trying to do, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, don't, I definitely don't know the answer. I would um, love, but perhaps it's a naive love, um, hot wish for some of these big long-term problems to be taken away from that political um, cycle. I, I don't know how you do that, but I think it is essential. And I think there are some deeply unsexy things that need to be given much more thought than they are. So the water system, um, the grid system, um, there are all sorts of parts of our infrastructure that are not in a good place. And I think the supply chain, which you raised, Francesca, is, a, is again, it's deeply unsexy understanding um, in detail you know, where various screws and ball bearings come from. But unless you do, you can't build that resilient infrastructure that you need. So I'm afraid I don't know the answer, but I really recognize the problem. Helen, do we need, I mean, is one of the ways that we're going to be able to deal with these risks, do we need a sort of significant institutional refresh, if you like? But both here and the United States, where, where it seems the political system is, is not delivering in many ways. Yeah, I mean, I think it's absolutely right to say that um, the institutions of democracy in a number of Western countries, including the United States and, and Britain, uh, are, 
have not been, you know, like working as well as we would hope that they do. I mean, I think that that's in some sense inevitable because I think that actually forms of government, any form of government and democracy isn't actually an exception um, to this, that they in some sense decay over time and they have to be, they have to be renewed. And that that's not actually very easy in long-standing democracies like um, Britain and the um, United States. But I, I'm not really convinced that the fundamental problems that we faced are a result of our institutions and the way in which our political institutions work. I'm convinced that they're fundamental problems because of the nature of the problems themselves, that they actually are just like exceptionally hard. Mm -hmm. And that that is true, uh, for example, in relation to the domestic energy transition, but it's also true internationally in how do we all in the world, in some sense, learn to live with the return of China as a power, the rise of India as a power, and the way in which America has become a much more complicated power, I think, than it, than it used to be. Because we, in one sense, we get caught in this idea that American power is declining because Chinese power is rising. But actually, I think in a number of ways, America has become more powerful than it was 10 years through ago. Through technology. Through technology, but also through finance. I mean, American financial yeah. power is considerably greater than it was before the financial crash. The role of the Federal Reserve in terms of its international consequences is amplified several times over than what it was. The United States is now you know, the world's largest oil producer. That gives it a power that it didn't, that it didn't have before. So we've got to get used to the complexities of... American power, as well as the rise of um, Chinese power. I'm not convinced that the international institutions are the place that that's going to happen um, either. I, I think that a lot of it turns on the ability of you know, individuals in these institutions to exercise good judgment and have good understanding about the world in which we now live. Could I, could I, right. very, could I just tag on one comment? So, so in terms of infrastructure, um, I do know that in, in the wake of uh, increasing attention to subsea infrastructure, that within NATO Article 3, you know, the need to protect critical infrastructure is a much greater focus in this hybrid uh, threat spectrum. Um, that will not solve the bigger issue or the bigger problem, but I'm hoping it could serve as, as momentum to increase attention to, to critical societal infrastructure um, in, in a bigger way. Uh. Yeah, well, the gentleman there. Yep. Hi, Atrishman Ray Goswami from King's College London. In recent years, there's been a growing trend of small states hedging against having to take sides in great power competition by bolstering their ties with middle powers instead. Uh, for instance, we've seen Saudi Arabia and the UAE invest significant amounts of money in supply chains and businesses in sub-Saharan African countries. And just last week, India and a number of countries in the South Pacific uh, held summit talks where a number of significant agreements were signed. Uh, where do great powers fit within these emerging geopolitical dynamics and how are these trends expected to shape ties between great and middle, power, middle powers in the future? Thank you. It depends who you think is great and who's middle and who's small. I suppose who wants to tackle that one? I can start, so you can take the most difficult parts of it. <laughs> um, so I think that we are... So a lot of what we said in the past few days leaves, seems to leave middle power or small power with no agency. While your question clearly shows that these countries have agency, even in the big power competition. And we talked about these as uh, sort of conflict grounds rather than very important areas where they, very important actors, sorry, that they can shape the world as, as we see it. And I think as Europeans, and I can reiterate, I think the UK is part, is part of Europe, we have a great role to play in proposing that alternative that you were mentioning of, in, in proposing a system that is not necessarily within the conflict between China and the United States, in trying to uphold at least a backbone of international rule-based system. A lot of these countries want rules that, you know, can protect them against this situation of competition between big powers. What I'm really afraid of is that we've been trying for a few years and failing dramatically. So my fear is that there's also a little bit of tiredness in, uh, in, in these countries about the, the alternative that we can propose and therefore our next move shouldn't be a grand plan such as the European Union Global Gateway or anything like that. It should really be something where you sit at the table and you try to understand how we can come to a better um, solution for all of us. And I suppose that comes down to how much room there really is 
for countries that aren't America or China to be autonomous? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's actually a pretty profound question for the European Union, not just for um, any medium-sized power like the United Kingdom. And a, a lot of what um, President Macron's had to say for quite some time now is premised on the, the notion that unless the European Union reinvents itself, that it's going to be irrelevant as a power in a world dominated by American-Chinese rivalry. I mean, I think it's certainly true that certain medium-sized powers have shown some autonomy uh, in recent years. I think it's easier for the commodity exporters, so Saudi Arabia and Iran, but not only those, but I think that they're the two clear examples. I think the real test case, in a way, though, is going to be South Korea, um, because South Korea obviously is trying to hedge on the security side with the US and on the economic side with um, China. It's been willing thus far to stand up to the US at least a little bit over the semiconductor um, issue. But what happens if relations between US and China in the Pacific deteriorate further to the point where we, might, where we could be talking about a war over Taiwan? And then I think the choices for a country like a state like South Korea become much, much harder. Um, that there wouldn't be, I think, much room for like optimism about not being able to go one way or the other at that point. Well, let's, let's try over this side. Um, everyone seems to be sitting over there asking questions. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of three coming from there. So uh, let's start at the back with Robert. Yeah. Sorry to ask a question again. Um, something that hasn't come up at all. Where does rapidly aging in developed societies end up on your scale of risk? Where the problems, for instance, are becoming acute, say, in the UK and in Italy, because uniquely they have a public health system of free service at the point of delivery, which seems to be absolutely unsustainable, and you are getting greater morbidity descending the age scale. In other words, people that would have chronic diseases in their 60s, they're now in their 50s and 40s. I rest my case, but okay. I think it's part of the resilience picture, is it? I mean, you could add Japan up to that, I imagine. Demographics? Uh, I think you're better <laughs> than I am. To <laughs> OK, apologies. Um, so where does it come in the risk register? I mean, it, it gets so hard because there are so many. Um, I, I see it as one of the kind of chronic risks that we face rather than the acute risks. And the chronic risks tend to get a lot less attention than the acute risks because not, there's not something going bang and everyone's not running around chasing a problem. Um, so I, again, I, I don't know the answer. Um, I think having conversations, and I, and I don't know whether these conversations are taking place, but stepping through what does it actually mean? So how does this problem manifest? How do we, what can we do to... But it also feeds into migration, of course, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, and geopolitically, it feeds into different powers having diff rising or declining um, power because of their demographics. Um, so there's a kind of how do you deal with it in your own nation? And then there's a how does that affect the balance of power question? What do you think? No, it, absolutely. It, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a fiscal risk. And in the world in which we live of higher interest rates, I, I wouldn't call them high interest rates by any historical standards, but not the world of the, the 2010s, then having ever-growing fiscal commitments that you can't necessarily really do anything um, about becomes a risk to financial market stability, becomes a, well, it becomes a, it, it can even become a risk to a government's entire existence, as Liz Truss, you know, like, found out about financial um, markets. And then when you combine, you know, like, ageing societies and the pressure on the health service with six societies, uh, are people dropping out of the, the labour force because they're not well enough to work any longer. There you've got the explanation of at least some part, I think, of Britain's economic problems over the um, last year or so. And then, as you say, Adam, that opens up the migration question again in what we know is politically very difficult conditions where discussing, discussing more people migrating to Britain uh, is. So it isn't just that it's an economic risk, it quickly becomes a political risk too, because as we know, migration issues have got the potential to destabilise democracies, as we saw over the last decade. I mean, demographic decline, I think, also uh, an overlooked factor in 
the Soviet Union and Russia's decline mm -hmm. as well. But, yeah. I'm also thinking of conscription, countries with national conscription, who's going to wear uniforms and, and fight, and who will be in the reserves. That's another, <laughs> another area that comes to mind. Right, lady there. Yeah. Thank you. Marina Barat from the Pinsker Center. Um, so the conversation touched upon the economic risk that the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative poses via um, lending conditions and uh, some countries defaulting on the debt. So I wanted to ask whether the BRI poses a security risk to the West and to NATO, if you will, and um, what can we do and what should be done to counteract it? Thank you. The answer is yes, but that is just because the BRI, it can be anything. It has been double, it has a double knot with the figure of Xi Jinping and for a long time it was basically China's foreign policy and any investment that China was making in foreign policy. Um, it is a security risk if we think about investments for the technology transfer, if we think about investment in critical national infrastructures and so on and so forth. It can also be a security risk if you think about the involvement in third countries also in these same infrastructures and in the role that these countries have in the supply chain that we need for our own commodities. So it is indeed a security risk. I think a lot has already been done if we think about the adoption of investment, investment screening mechanisms based on national security concerns or if you think about what you mentioned, now NATO has actually the whole resilience. Um, I don't think it's a, I don't know if it's a working group or a unit, but anyhow, they work on resilience, which is important, and they tackled these issues. Okay, a question there, question there, then that'll probably be our time up, but we'll go as quick as we can. Thank you. Joshua Minsky, Director of Policy for Congressman Mike Rogers. One of the things that hasn't been discussed and quite possibly be, to borrow a GOP metaphor, the elephant in the room, is short-term and medium-term political instability in the United States. We're seeing President Trump is already a candidate, potentially 2024, and then shaping it through 2028. How is that affecting the calculus and hedging, in your view, for dealing with some of these issues when, while there has been presidential transitions every four years, now it is a element of unpredictability, unpredictability can mean instability at the same time? OK, we've got DeSantis announcing his candidacy tonight. Well, I think it's, it's very much a factor in relation to calculations in Europe about Russia's war, um, because <coughs> under any circumstances in which Trump were to return to the presidency, then the degree of American commitment to Ukraine would obviously very much um, be on the table. And that um, we couldn't expect, I think, uh, a Trump presidency to uh, support Ukraine in the way in which Biden, even if we take into account the amount of like pressure within the foreign security establishment that was put on Trump in his attempts to withdraw from Syria, where twice, effectively, he tried to withdraw and was pulled back, I think it will be a lot harder to constrain him about Ukraine, particularly because Ukraine would have been, I think, in any scenario in which Trump won, won uh, an anti-war sentiment would be part of that. I, I think the place where you might have expected a bit more hedging. We're not really seeing it, I think, it goes back to the Saudi question, because in the respite that the Saudis had from their predicament was really the Trump presidency. Remember that the first place that Trump went when he became elected was to, um, to Riyadh. And I don't think that they're, I don't see that they're actually hedging this and thinking, OK, things will get better for us if we just wait out a year until Biden's out of the, the, the White House. They seem to have made their, their move in saying that, no, our future is going to have to be in this complicated Russia, China, Iran space. And on that. Hi, uh, Masters in National Security, King, King's College, London. There's been a lot of talk about strategic competition what are the avenues of cooperation between the United States and China? And how do you bring about managed strategic competition with left and right limits and actionable plans for the future? Because that's the question. Polly, I, I did, obviously you're dealing with, with a lot of global information. I mean, to what extent is, is China a partner rather than an opponent, you think? In, 
I, I mean, so for in Palantir, we don't work at all with um, China, but in terms of sort of strategic competition and how do you have those um, conversations, I, I'm going to go in a really strange angle, but a, um, we talk a lot about strategic advantage, um, which means advantage over someone else. And we had some science fiction writers come and talk to us, and they, they sort of started talking about why do you, what is this advantage? Why do you have to beat someone? Um, and I think there are places where you can think about the world in a different way and think about the world around where you can cooperate. And I know that there's parts of that that feel naive, but I also feel quite strongly that um, if we want the world to remain as peaceful as possible, you do need to be able to hold those thoughts at the same time. So I think there are definitely areas where you can have cooperative discussion um, as, as governments um, in areas like climate change. Um, and I think trying to find those is a way of keeping channels open. I, I think also that it's important to have a, a long, long-ish time horizon for this. Uh, it seems to me that there is a lot of difficulty in getting towards the, many of those formats at the moment, but that at the more junior levels, uh, also in, in the Chinese government, there is interest, but it, it will take time to lay the groundwork for for those cultures also to, to evolve upwards in the system. Okay, I want to end on the notes of optimism because we've uh, listed a, a great many uh, risks facing the world. I just, uh, for final thoughts from each of you, I would like you, if possible, to come up with not necessarily a quick fix, but something that you think can deal or mitigate the threat that these risks pose. Oh dear. Um, well, I think if I were to find a, one area of optimism, it is that change is certainly possible in terms of the popular perception of threats and risks. If you look at Sweden and Finland, uh, opinions regarding uh, NATO uh, membership transformed. And I think that a lot of the time we're looking at uh, long-term processes and things take time, etc. But things can also change very quickly and I think that makes me hopeful. Um, I kind of would say this, wouldn't I? But I think the opportunities from the democratisation of data, the ability for people to be able to share and understand what is going on in the world and know, know that which is knowable at any time in any place, I think is, is hugely powerful. And it's hugely powerful in pulling um, countries and people together. How, how do you do that? I mean, who owns that data? You see? Um, that's, the, that's the problem, isn't it? So there's, there are, I mean, government's own data, individual's own data. There are huge amounts of data everywhere that um, can be pulled together and can be used in ways that, that haven't been used previously. Um, no, but it, it, I mean, some people see it's a great threat that governments in China, for example... Yeah, or, yeah, or, or, so, so absolutely, yes. You need to put your kind of your privacy constraints around that and your governance around that, and that is, is very, very important, um, the, of the ultimate importance, but the fact that it enables you to be able to understand and make decisions based on actual evidence rather than solely judgment, I think is incredibly important. Francesca? A bit on that. I think the, the better way to manage risk is to make a proper risk assessment. And that has to take into account what is happening in your home country and your relationship with every and each other partner you have. And in that case, big data are a big help. And I don't think anybody has been doing the homework properly using, using a methodology and replicating it. And without that, all of these conversations are sort of like a, a, a nice, but they're not really proposing actionable solutions to make us more resilient and manage these risks. Hmm. Well, I think the world absolutely depends. Our own, everyone's future depends upon technological innovation. There is no successful energy transition without technological uh, innovation, particularly um, solving the problems um, of the storage of electricity over periods of months. And we're living in a world in which technological competition over the energy transition is taking place, quite obviously between the United States and China and the European Union and to some extent the UK are trying to catch up. Um, but that competition, although that competition has got the capacity to be destructive, that competition has also got the capacity to be creative in terms of getting to the point where somebody somewhere actually succeeds at doing the technological things that are necessary. And that point, it's for everybody's benefit. Now, we still might have to accept where the geopolitical fallout of that is, like who wins this technological competition, but we are all still 
the beneficiaries of it because the energy transition is essential and the energy transition depends on technological success. There you are, no to optimism. Thank you all very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, our panel. Now, the um, final session, of course, this afternoon. There are some refreshments up on the eighth floor. There's also uh, the panel uh, chaired by Professor John Bew uh, on uh, the uh, uh, security situation. Uh, Deborah Haynes, my colleague, will be here later on this afternoon. Then finally, two very important uh, uh, events. Um, there is going to be uh, the interview or the uh, con conversation with the current Chief of the Defence Staff, uh, Tony Radikin. So uh, please stay on for those.